Good evening and welcome to select board meeting of June 25th, 2018. Call, I'm calling the select board meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. Uh, as is always the case, we start with our uh, opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. Um, are there any things on the agenda that my colleagues wanted to mention or note about it as far as what we've got on tonight's agenda? Um, I don't think there's any real additions or changes per se there. Um, and so, yes? Yeah, the only thing was to, to remind you that under number five that there is a request that we talk about committee boards appointments and reappointments. Okay. I think Paul had one thing on there and I had one thing on there. Okay. So, you yes, I have I uh, one announcement. I'd like to note that um, I'm very pleased to welcome Angela Mills to our meeting tonight. This is her first day of work as the executive assistant to the town manager. Um, previously, um, she was the administrative assistant for the Crocker Farm School for eight years. She's an Amherst resident, grammar, graduate of Amherst College, um, parent, uh, coach, uh, worked at multiple uh, other institutions. Um, really impressed during her interview process, which was a pretty rigorous <laughs> process. Um, went through three sets of interviews with some, a lot of good people and um, always brought a real can-do attitude. Uh, she's bilingual. Um, I think she uh, came in sort of a little bit sad this morning because she was leaving her Crocker Farm family, but we're really, really, really pleased to have her starting today. So uh, welcome, Angela. All right, so welcome. And so we'll, uh, uh, so I guess the first question I have is, are there any people here for public comment not related to an agenda item? Because we'll do that public comment when we get to those. If not, then uh, we'll go through and we'll do public comment at the time of the uh, uh, agenda items. We do have a, a public hearing tonight, a formal public hearing, which will not take up until about seven o'clock, uh, just because it was noticed in the paper as a seven o'clock start time, so we'll do some other things in the meantime. Um, so the first order of business tonight is uh, under action and discussion items, section four of our agenda is the town manager performance evaluation review of the timeline. So in our packet uh, was a two page, I believe, timeline of things relative to the current year's review of the manager. Um, and I guess the first question was, I, I got some feedback from, from one member about their schedule uh, and how that played into um, how this uh, evaluation timeline works and could be complicated for them as the summer rolls along. Um, and I was wondering if anybody else had uh, noticed any problems or issues or things they wanted to mention relative to that timeline. Uh, the see. only thing that, and I had previously noted that um, I will not be here for the one meeting on the 27th of August. Okay, so that's, that raises an interesting point because we may end up in a circumstance, um, the lion's share of the work relative to the, to the, uh, uh, the manager's evaluation will really take place on the previous Monday when we all sit and read and it's exciting television because we're just sitting and reading each other's evaluations for the first time. But that following Monday is usually when we try to sort of finish things up and potentially go into executive session to talk with the manager about his contract for the coming year. Um, so we may need to shift that date because it sounds as though a couple of us may not be able to be here and participate as fully. So we'll see uh, when Mr. Wald returns what his summer schedule looks like. So we'll, we'll keep that one as a question mark, that last one. And, the, 27th and question. the 27th of August, yes. Because um, we may need to investigate uh, a following meeting or maybe even a special meeting if we need to to sort of contend with that yes mr slaughter could we talk for a minute then about the schedules of the people who are here in terms of moving that up to later in the week of monday august 20th if that helps at all which it doesn't say for example if mr steinberg is leaving the 21st but um or if it's later in that week it, what I'm saying is you know if it's not Monday the 27th is it going to be at all that week or would it need to go to the following week or do we back it up a little I mean just to give ourselves a sense of what we're looking at here right at least to the people who are here so for me 
personally. Um, you know, later in the week of the 20th, 20th is the Monday, 27th is a Monday as well, um, is an available week. Uh, there are days that week that are available to me, so we could potentially, certainly personally I can do that. Um, we're scheduled, I think, if the, the, the interesting thing that happens after the 27th is we run into the Labor Day weekend and uh, election day, pr primary election day is the fourth, um, which would push us back. We have our scheduled meeting on the uh, fifth, which is Wednesday. Um, so if we didn't do the 27th and we went later, it would be the fifth, which is probably why you suggested is there a time before that Monday that was uh, workable for other folks. And so we don't know what Mr. Wall's schedule is like, but. Yeah, I mean, the other thing you have to think about is your own workload because um, if you're going to be revising um, the major piece that's being discussed on the 20, 20th, how many days do you need to turn that around? And um, so I th you should think about that and not commit tonight. Right. Um, the other possibility is if it's not major changes that happen afterwards, um, we could give our comments to you individually, that we who are, whoever is not here, mm -hmm. to you by email, and uh, then you could uh, have it for the, know what we said on the night of the 27th, but we couldn't share it with the group, obviously. Right, right. <coughs> In addition to that, which is of course true that you need to be really thoughtful about predicting um, how much you might have to change between the 20th and the 27th. Fortunately, it hasn't been so much the last couple of years that this group has been working together. So I think that that, that you know, is some slight consolation that it might not be a lot. But the other concern I have beyond the individual comments that say Mr. Steinberg, for example, could provide you is that he would then miss the executive session and I'm less comfortable with that. I'm much happier to have all of us present for executive session, so. Right, Ms. Kruger? Um, and I think I, I had sent the chair uh, and the manager my schedule and potential conflicts, and while I might be able to be here on the 27th, it's not a particularly good day for me because I am going to be doing something all day long somewhere else and rushing back for that. So similarly, I wouldn't want to miss it, but if it was the only day, I would try to come, but would prefer to push that back. So what if we proposed the Friday? The 24th? How does that comport with peoples? The peoples who can't be the 27th, um, <laughs> can those peoples be available the 24th? For an evening meeting? It doesn't really matter when we schedule it for so my question is why do we why can't we just push the whole thing out um, into September if we can't do it in August there isn't it's a self-imposed deadline it's uh, I, I think I want I, I want to understand why we can't make it take a little longer if people are going to be away and it's not going to work for us with these dates So generally, generally the idea was we tried to get it over with. It didn't always happen. There were years prior to your serving on the board where it certainly didn't happen in this time frame. Um, I think to some extent it's also, there's some question as to how much it matters to us that there's a primary election in there and how that might be influencing individual people's workload before and after. And if that appears to have any influence on the executive session in terms of the incoming council, whereas this is still ours at this point and still very much the select board's role, whereas one might conceivably argue that as people make it through the preliminary election process, it'll be more real who people might be and what their views might be associated with moving forward. So this year is a year I would be less inclined to say, Let's just not worry about it. Let's do it in the middle of September and just be done with it. I'm, I'm a little uneasy about any appearance of any 
influence there as opposed to Okay, so let me put it bluntly. So we finish the evaluation, and then we think we need to work on it a little bit more, and then a week or so later, we have an executive session, and there are people who are running for council who say, you know what, we pay that town manager too much. That would not be a good time to be having that executive session. I would rather do that before we move further into the transition. I, I hear your point, but I actually don't consider it a plausible issue. Um, in in this case, that I, I don't believe it would affect um, those evaluations, but I think it's it's sort of a, a good theoretical consideration. But um, I think there's uh, an election. Some people are candidates, some people are not. But we're doing our work and we're doing it with integrity. Um, if we can, if we can't do it within the time frame as proposed, we need to make adjustments if we all want to participate. So. If it's the 24th, and depending on if that's even going to work, that would leave the um, chair uh, taking the comments from the 20th and completing the, com the com uh, compilation, what do we call it, the composite um, by the 24th. Right. Is that right? Right. So the goal would be in, in that circumstance, if we did it on that Friday, that, you know, Hopefully it wouldn't be a circumstance where we show up to the meeting and I hand it out. I'd hopefully have it ready for you in advance of that a little bit so you had some time to look it over. Um, well, which is really the 23rd for you. So right, which is, 22, which is 21, 22, and 20. Right, which is still possible, but it's not optimal. But at the same time, <clears throat> hopefully, again, it depends on sort of how close I get it on the 20th. Because <laughs> the goal is to sort of capture the, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. essence of, of you know, the five evaluations into a single coherent document but yeah and I have to be honest uh, unless we were meeting first thing in the morning on the 24th I couldn't attend a meeting on the 24th anyway because okay. well, actually leaving now. so uh, it would have to be the night of the 23rd or first thing in the morning on the 24th and if that's not a doable thing then I think we should go back to the the original plan, and I do remind you that the same thing happened with my absence last year for the exact same meeting. So, and it, we survived. Yeah. You, did, you guys did well. <laughs> so, in that case, are you saying partly we're, we're balancing the fact that Ms. Kruger's also indicated she might not be available on the 27th, which would mean two people that would not be available for executive session, which is even worse. But if that were not true, are you saying you feel relatively comfortable based on last year's experience not being there? for executive session if we decide to go ahead with that? Or would you, or is, are we leaning toward after Labor Day at this point? Um, and will people be back <laughs> It's my other question. Mm -hmm. If, uh, I mean, I don't want to belabor this longer, um, but if uh, you decided to meet later in the day on the 24th and I could be there, that's what I was referring to. I'm sure you guys will do great. If we have four people we know will be there. But What's your cutoff time on the 24th? For, you said if it's the morning. Yeah. I uh, don't like Friday evening at all as an option. No, I would, I would probably, we would probably need to leave by late morning. So, so should we suggest that Mr. Slaughter give us some thought and get back to us? Yeah, I think I'm going to need to because we'll also need to get some input from Mr. Wall because I'm not sure we fully know his schedule yet. But yes. Right. And the other part of it is, is you could talk to Mr. Bachman and see if he has plans associated with those dates as well or standing meetings that are hard to move. But so theoretically, we're looking at the morning of Friday, the 24th, early, like how, like I'm seven to eight? I'm just going to pencil it in. Just to give people some options. So Friday, the 24th at like eight. The other issue associated with that is in terms of what we normally get done then, like you say, a lot depends on how much was done on the 20th, and so how many edits you have to do right. um, before then. Maybe it's two sentences or maybe it's two pages. <laughs> it's right. hard to know. Um, is that we would normally have a press release that day, even though, and then that would include the revised composite evaluation. So that's the other piece too. So if it's just so complicated then pushing it out might be the other option. But perhaps I'm, what I'm saying is perhaps offer Friday the 24th at 
say whatever, 8 o'clock, I don't know what works for people, um, to Mr. Wald as well, mm -hmm. and then say, if not then, then our next meeting is Wednesday the 5th. Right. Um, if that's somehow better. And it also means we may need to schedule an additional meeting in September then, if we're adding this meeting right. to September's workload. Right. To the, that means to the we fifth, might have might some additional work right. in Depending September on. that won't get done on the 5th. Right. Okay. So you'll let us know. You'll let us know. I, I, will. I put it in for the morning of the 24th as a placeholder so I don't schedule something else instead. Right. But no, I think that's um, a good idea in the, in I know the moment. It's in flux. Pencil it off just in case. And so okay. hopefully we'll uh, try to bring some clarity to that fairly soon. We'll get some feedback from Mr. Wall mm -hmm. if anybody else has subsequent and later thoughts on the matter. Um, those are all at this point, you know, fine for me, uh, I think. So I think, um, was there anything else in the timeline that was noticeably missing and or um, seemed off in any way? Um, I will say that it, it, I did put in fiscal year 19 goals with, mm -hmm. you know, as a way of describing it. I don't know that that's necessary. It won't be the classic goals that we usually do because we'll be transitioning mid-year. Um, so we'll, that's a way to describe it. That probably will not necessarily be exactly what it looks like and how it's shaped. So some of our conversations will be about what we want it mm -hmm. to be and how we uh, set that up for our town council that will follow us. Um, so I will follow up with people and, uh, and try to find out uh, what will work best as far as uh, late August and, and getting all of us there in case of an executive uh, for the executive session and finalizing the the manager's um, evaluation. Mr. Slaughter, yes. so just so that I understand, so um, if all comments are due by Friday the 13th, um, when What's the integer of time where we will have everything to work on our own um, written evaluation? So it looks like it would be, is it? So you have from, um, so by Monday the 16th of July, I'll make sure that everybody has a copy of all the, the input and feedback we've okay. received from staff and, and folks around town. Um, and you will have until uh, the 6th of August, which which I think is the same length of time we had before, which I want to say is two, three weeks from the 16th okay. to the 6th. And that allows us where we have other things in our own lives that we have, can find some time between. This, so this, the 16th, you, cause I, you deliver us those packets. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so everything's due by the end of the day on Friday. Um, and I will get those, and I may actually drop them off to you before Monday, but no later than Monday, I'll, I'll get copies to you, meaning the 16th of July, which is Monday. So you should have three full weeks with all the materials. Yes. Just confirming that yes, well, and in the recent past, a lot of it's all just been email that's just been reforwarded to us, so that hasn't right. been difficult, as opposed to years when we've had lots of paper. But the, um, the packet, for the Friday is supposed to include the self-evaluation from the town manager. So that won't be news to us Monday night. It will, in theory, have been delivered to us Friday night. So even though we may not have all the public comments to, um, in our hands, we will at least have had a time to read that because we then talk to the town manager about that document that night. Right. And if it's not in the packet, that makes it really impossible to talk about it. So, okay. So there's a certain amount of pressure on the manager to have it completed so it can mm -hmm. go in our packet on the afternoon of the 13th. Yep. Yeah. From okay. so. foreboding or not, I don't know. It'll happen. <laughs> Just will. How uh, sensitive well you are to Friday the 13th, mm -hmm. but anyway. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I'm just making some notes. So. so I think we'll we'll move on. We have a couple minutes before 7 o'clock, so we'll wait until 7 for our, for our public hearing. So I think at this point, why don't we... And I think our marijuana discussion this evening uh, will be rather lengthy. So I think that um, why don't we take up our consent calendar items, because those should be fairly quick. 
uh, unless there's some concern or issue with those. And so we can take care of that and get that out of the way. If someone would like to make a motion relative to those. The consent calendar. I guess the one question I had on the consent calendar is it's somewhat unusual that we're uh, being asked to approve the change of dates for our, uh, where the, both the original and the new date were in the, in the past. <laughs> yeah. And I was just curious if there's an explanation to go with that. There was no sure. paper to go with it. So that was a judgment call we had to make whether to have a formal vote, a, a post uh, after the event occurred, we had reviewed this um, and made the decision that was a, a, a minor change. You had already approved the substance of the motion by thought, thought through transparency and for you know, the record, it would be better for the board to vote on it. So it is So should it is C or? C, yeah. Right. We're, we're blessing so there's an A, B, and C in this. So I'm comfortable then going ahead and making the motion, but I'm going to pause in case somebody else has okay. something they want to pull from it before I do. Okay. I move to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for June 25, 2018, as presented. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous with one absent. So Mr. Slaughter, yes. if I could just make a note, I really appreciate the fact that we got this beautiful map that yes. actually shows us where things are at UMass. I think that helps us understand better what they're attempting to do. Right. So thank you for the map. So given that we're still a little shy of 7 o'clock, I think what we'll go to is under uh, Section 5 of our agenda is committee and boards, appointments, and reappointments, and I think Mr. Steinberg, you had a couple of things you wanted to mention relative to this topic, and maybe Mr. Bachman, you did as well, so I'm not sure who would prefer to go first. I think there are two committees. Uh, one, Mr. Bachman uh, sent us a memo on, so I should let him speak to that. Okay. okay. So we received notification uh, that as of June 30th, the Historical Commission will not have enough members to hold a meeting. One seat is vacant. Two members' terms uh, are expiring on June 30th, 18th, and they do not wish to be continue. And one member has resigned because she is moving out of town. Uh, the Historical Commission is a seven-member seven body. It needs four members to have a quorum. The charter allows for, uh, requires a quorum plus one, which would equal five for this body. Um, so at the end of June, the Historical Commission will only have three members. So two members, you're permitted to appoint uh, up to two members to the Historical Commission. And we have two applicants who have submitted uh, uh, CAFs already who are in our files. And I just was looking for direction to initiate that process of the interview and things like that. And to also sort of publicly let people know that this is a vacancy that, that we'll be seeking to fill in the, under the terms of the transition provisions of the charter. Yes. So this being a town manager appointment, yep, I, that sounds reasonable to me to do interviews. Also, this is a great way of letting people know, hopefully. They all read our packet this weekend that said, oh, look, I could apply well, for the Historical did, Commission, and that would be great. I am not eager to um, recommend the idea that the Historic District Commission members be moved over to the Historic Commission. I think we've... Those are very separate agencies, and while there is certainly familiarity and enthusiasm and some previous service associated with some of those, I just don't think that's such a good choice. But it is your appointment. Mm -hmm. I think you have to confirm, though. Any other comment or suggestion for the manager relative to this? Yes, yeah, so the select board has to confirm the appointments. Yes. I think no the only, uh, my only comment is, is that uh, given the importance of this particular board that has the ability to um, make some very important decisions um, regarding demolition of property and uh, needs to uh, function in an appropriate manner, I would feel more comfortable if the town manager had one more, at least one more minimum person 
to consider than, appoint, than positions to fill. So uh, I would hope that through public notice and um, any other efforts we can, that we can um, provide that to him. So as a reminder to folks who are watching or might be watching later, uh, the Citizen Activity Forum or the CAF is available online and that's one way if you're interested in serving on the Historical Commission you can submit your name for such consideration. Um, we don't, under the transition provisions, have a lot of latitude to go appointing all around but in this circumstance we're going to be shy of a quorum and given what Mr. Steinberg said about the legal authority of this particular um, commission it's important to keep that fully uh, staffed up with uh, citizens. Ms. Brewer. Thank you, and sometimes the, the CAFs we have on file, which we consider personnel records, we don't, and the people have moved or whatever, and so sometimes it's always not always a slam dunk that, that they will be available, so I hope people will consider applying. Given our staffing situation with Ms. Mills just joining us today, et cetera, um, I'm wondering if the town manager might direct staff to put a news flash out about mm -hmm. this we opening. We have not done that a lot with committees and boards. Sometimes we do it when we have a whole list of vacancies, but this one might catch a few people's eye, so. So, so did you have another yeah, I don't know if you wanted to um, go to the hearing and the other issue or come back to it, but um, for the sake of the public notice, in any way, I'll mention what the other committee is <laughs> at a minimum, and that is um, we had been required by the transition provision in the charter to um, appoint a committee that had the responsibility to review the um, existing bylaws of the town and to provide to the council when it is first seated um, information about those um, bylaws that it might need to consider for revision and we added to the committee charge one additional piece which is hey while well, you're doing that if you notice any bylaws that seem particularly outdated or otherwise you would think require attention to also include those in the list for the, um, just so that brought to the attention of the uh, uh, the council. And uh, so that's what, um, there is a vacancy that occurred because we appointed the committee, but one person for um, has had to submit a resignation. So I have been working on filling the, um, uh, trying to find applicants to recommend to you because this one is a select board appointment role. And uh, I had several people who've been recommended to me, three in particular, and um, one of them has indicated unavailability. Um, and uh, a second person is considering it and is gonna get back to me later in the week. The third name is somebody who is recommended by a current committee member and is not a resident of the town of Amherst, but is a resident of an adjoining town. And um, there were strong reasons that the one committee member had for making that recommendation when I spoke with him. Uh, when you look at the um, charter itself, uh, because we are sort of operating under the charter, um, and the charter says that uh, um, the uh, committee members should be residents of the town of Amherst unless um, a proposal is made otherwise, and for good reason stated to uh, the council. Um, we do stand in for the council um, in, under the um, charter provisions for transition. So it's a two-part question that I think that this um, board would uh, need to, I was hoping to get some advice from, and I'm not sure I want to, we want to get into that conversation now, but just to explain what it is, is one is um, whether there's any um, feelings as to whether the decision should be made at all about whether to consider somebody from outside of who's not a resident of Amherst, whether that feels 
is it comfortable and appropriate decision to make? And then if so, um, whether there's any input people have on that underlying issue. I think we'll hold off on having that conversation because we are now just after seven o'clock. And so um, I think we will have that a little bit later, but we'll thank you for bringing that up and, and letting us mull that over over the intervening time. So <clears throat> at this point, we've reached uh, just after seven o'clock, and so we need to uh, open our public hearing relative to parking regulation in town. And so I think we need a motion to open the public hearing. The one we have on our motion sheet's rather lengthy. I don't know that we need the entirety of that. So if someone would like to make the motion to open the hearing. Which could probably start and stop right at the end of the colon there. Just to, I don't know if we need to identify all the particulars, but I'll take the motion however we, it's made. We usually read the legal ad at some point. Open to so we have that too. That's basically the same thing. Yeah. So, in the ad that was was uh, in the newspaper, it says the Amherst Select Board will hold a public hearing on Monday, June 25th, 2018, beginning at 7 p.m., Town Room, Amherst Town Hall, to solicit public comment on proposed new and or review of existing parking regulations. One, off the off lot off of Kellogg Avenue, adjacent to the Ann Whalen Apartments parking area. Two, east side of the Boltwood lot off of Kellogg Avenue. Three, South Pleasant Street, four, Fisher Street, and five, Olympia Drive. The select board will be considering changes to parking regulations, including but not limited to parking restrictions, tow zones, and or addition or elimination of restricted free or metered parallel parking spaces. So that's our actual um, legal ad. And so with that, do we usually vote to go into, I'm not recalling since we haven't done this in a while. No, we just, somebody opens. So it's. I think you can just announce. I think I can just open. announce we're opening it at 7.06. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at this point, we had several different pieces. And so um, I believe we have a memo from the downtown parking working group, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll go through those items. So the, the recommendations of the parking working group were as follows. Um, Not the right number that I want to look at. Where did it go? Oh, here it is. All right. Uh, there are 13 parking spaces off of Kellogg Avenue adjacent to the Ann Whalen apartment, uh, apartments on the east side of the parking lot, making them available at 50 cents per hour for a four hour time limit um, was one recommendation. So that's an area just behind the Bang Center. Um, the second recommendation was to eliminate the five taxi parking, in quotes. Uh, space along the east side of South Pleasant Street at the North Common. These spaces are currently reserved for taxi cabs from 11 p.m. to 2 p.m. Thursday through Saturday, and there are currently no taxi companies operating in Amherst. Um, the third recommendation was to add a second 15-minute free parking space on the east side of the Boltwood lock, lo Lot, I cannot speak this evening, sorry, off of Kellogg Avenue uh, to provide a, a quick place for people to, to pop in and out of some of the uh, restaurants and, and uh, businesses in and around that area. Um, and then the, the other items that we're discussing are also on Fisher Street. We, had a, uh, we took action last September to uh, make no parking essentially overnight between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, on Fisher Street on both the north and south sides. And then the, uh, the other recommendation uh, was on Olympia Drive. We had, um, in again, on that September 11th meeting last fall, we had uh, added meters to Olympia Drive and changed some, some uh, other parking on Olympia Drive, but in particular, the question was whether or not the current two-hour limit for that should be extended some longer period of time, and the manager um, had a recommendation relative to that. Did you want to speak to that at this point? Um, sure. Okay. Um, so Fisher Street, um, we talked about you had a public hearing or you met last uh, September. Uh, neighbors came in and t talked about the issues that they were facing, and I, and you put forward a temporary uh, pilot of having no parking from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. You've got some correspondence from the neighbors who I think are appreciating that. And uh, we've checked with the police department, the fire department, and the Department of Public Works, and there's, there are no real issues that have popped up up there. I think there was one ticket issued uh, at one point in time. But otherwise, people are abiding by the no parking rule. 
on Olympia Drive, um, you created 33 parallel parking sp spaces um, on a, at the same time. Uh, the issue for that is that those parking spaces aren't being used very often through um, by paying through the meter. People are using them and then getting ticketed. And it seems like we have not aligned our um, the length of time it takes for someone to utilize the the meter with um, what people's needs are. So people are overextending the, their their time uh, at the meter and getting tickets. And I think we what we try to do is to align our use of uh, what people's needs are with the meter time um, for that. M many people who utilize these parking spaces are using that to uh, go to class or something at UMass. And this, it's on the bus line. People are able to get down there. Two hours isn't long enough to go to a class and come back to your car. Um, and so the idea to extend the time frame would be to accommodate people like that. And if you are able to accommodate people on Olympia Drive, there's some sense that that might relieve some of the long-term parking that's being um, that's occurring downtown. It might relieve some of the long-term parking at the CVS parking lot. Thank you. So as far as how we discuss this, I think um, we'll have a bit of conversation about this, I think, and then we'll potentially open up uh, the, the mic for, for public comment relative to, to parking issues, but I w wanted to give the board itself an opportunity to sort of offer opinion and, and uh, discuss these different items. Yes. So I'm, <clears throat> I totally appreciate the idea of practically reflecting how people are using something. We try and do that with pathways and parks and that sort of thing as well. However, I think we actually want to discourage the activity you just mentioned. We, I'm unaware of us desiring to provide metered parking for people to take the bus to class from Olympia. The idea of the parking there was for the residents, which we knew UMass already had huge lots for the resi students well before the residents were there. It was our understanding that that's why we didn't require parking there was because they were going to be UMass residents, who, uh, students who could then buy permits from UMass. And we have talked many times in the past about one of the reasons we charge for parking downtown is so that students don't park downtown and go to class. This is the first I'm hearing of CVS lot being used that way in any way that's really impacting um, availability of the CVS lot. So I'm not feeling really comfortable with what to me is a very new idea of the way that we'd be using that because I don't want people parking in Olympia and going to class and coming back. I want people living at Olympia or people who are visiting people at Olympia, which could include parents, et cetera, and should put quite potentially be a longer time period based on when UMass doesn't enforce versus when it does enforce. But I don't understand the part about hoping to cover people while they go to class, because that's not what it's there for, as far as I understood. Ms. Kruger? Well, I, I can delight in agreeing with Ms. Brewer on this point. Um, going back and thinking of um, the permitting for Olympia Place, the idea is that you buy a parking um, placard, whatever they call it, at UMass and park in the UMass lots. This was the, for guests and visitors and um, others at Olympia Place because there seemed to be a willy-nilly kind of unmanaged parking where people were parking in the, it wasn't um, metered, it wasn't lined, and it wasn't safe. Um, I can see matching, I, I can see going from two hours to four hours because maybe for a visitor or an occasional user, that makes more sense. Um, the ticket revenue has been really high, so it makes me think people have not taken on the behavior of paying for UMass parking and are trying to use this. So my worry about the eight hour, first of all, it doesn't match anything except the CVS lot. But if you park for eight hours and then we stop at enforcement at six, you basically got it for 24 hours. And that becomes your de facto parking space instead of buying the UMass um, permit that you're supposed to have. We have no data that shows that UMass students are parking at CVS. That might be true, it might not be true. Until we have some data that establishes who the CVS lot users are, um, I think it's mere speculation that this is gonna draw from that. This, this was never supposed to be UMass parking. It was supposed to be Olympia Place, visitor, guest, delivery, 
short term um, kind of parking. What I remember from the hearing we had before was Mr. Mooring and I had a disagreement about whether it should be 50 cents or a dollar an hour. And I'm still, um, I would prefer the dollar an hour because it's a deal compared to what UMass charges at their spaces. So it would be um, charging half of what, or less than half of what UMass charges. And it seems to me, um, if you're gonna park right in front of that building, at least some of those should be the, should match what we have in town. But I can see multiple perspectives on that. But I, to go from two to eight without any data seems like a big leap to me. So I'm not there yet. Mr. Steinberg, any comments relative to that? <laughs> Since we've taken on the Olympia Place. Yeah, on the Olympia Place, I think the issues have been um, outlined. I'm hopeful that some of the information that we'll receive from the public tonight might shed some light on some of those issues, but I don't think I have anything I can add right now. Okay. Fantastic. So, uh, is there anything we wanted to mention right off the bat amongst ourselves relative to the other topics that are covered in the parking recommendations that to us? If not, then I'll, I'll see if there are folks in the audience that wish to speak relative to parking, the various topics that were brought up. Is anyone here for public comment relative to parking? Evidently not. Oh, but any parking, including Yes, certainly, but yes. Hold on so, you did say we could keep talking about the memo. So yeah. I started with Olympia Drive because right. that was the most recent one we talked right. about. For Fisher Street, I believe we received the information that we asked for. We wanted to know, were there problems? Was it taken care of? And also, did it Im negatively impact Harris Street? Right. And we'll, so we'll probably hear a little bit more about that, and that's covered in one of the letters. Right. But that's why I didn't ask about that one, because I felt like we got the information we were looking for associated with that trial. Right. And then, um, might I, if I might, yeah. maybe we could ask that the public talk to us first about Fisher Street and then maybe about Olympia, but then we take some time to talk amongst ourselves about the downtown parking working group before we move into the public part of that one? Sure, I think that's a fine order of it. So of those here to talk about parking, the topic on which you were wanting to talk about, was it Fisher Street mostly? Okay, please, just make sure to state Fine. who you are at the microphone um, so that the general audience knows who and then our minute taker can, can record that as well. And so introduce yourself and, and let us know. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. My name is Scott Paul. I'm a resident with my wife and a newborn infant, uh, Amelie, at uh, 1 5 Fisher Street. And we've been there now for uh, almost five years. And so um, since we've enacted the no parking zone, the environment of our neighborhood has changed overnight, literally. And um, we've been very grateful of the change and it's worked very well for this environment. Uh, we have seen a few cars parking um, on Harris Street. Um, so it has increased you know, periodically, but um, I'm a little detached from that. There's at least one neighbor that's a little closer. And, you know, she could speak better to that, but there's, there's also an apartment there as well. So that's kind of drawing some of the traffic in that corner between Harris and Fisher Street. Um, but from perspective of the neighbors, mainly on Fisher Street, we've seen much reduced traffic on our street and um, there's none of the incidents we've had. I have had zero calls into the police regarding any kind of noise incidents, as well as any kind of nuisances that I don't report. Um, I've had zero issues with that this year. So, so far so good. Um, we have. Also, you know, corresponded with some of the, the local, um, you know, residents, um, students, or whoever, the tenants. So that's also helped as well, I'm trying to keep that relationship going with some of the houses. It's been key as well. So uh, we'll continue to do that, you know. Every once in a while we have a live band, um, you know, pop up. <laughs> um, but besides that, for the parking, and that was the main issue, um, that noise has definitely been reduced. So thank you. And DPW took awesome action really fast. Uh, it was amazing. The signs went up. And, a matter of, like, I think two weeks, so. Thank you. So is there other public comment relative to Fisher and Harris Street? So if you wanna come forward and share your thoughts on that. I'm Kathleen Carroll at 11 Fisher Street, and I'd like to thank the select board for 
um, having this pilot project. It has significantly improved the quality of life um, on Fisher Street. I feel like I went from living in a parking lot to now I'm living in a residential neighborhood. So thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, Nicola Usher. I'm, I live on Harris Street, so speaking on behalf of some of us on the Harris side, we just want to echo what our um, Fisher Street neighbors have said in really supporting the existing, um, the existing parking situation has worked really well for them. In terms of uh, negative impact on Harris Street, I live um, on Harris right at the, like right where Fisher is. And um, I can say there's been maybe one or two cars that park overnight. It has not had a significant impact for me. Um, me personally, we had an email going. I heard from two other neighbors on Harris, one in the middle of the street, one closer to Pine. And we all agree that there's no need to extend it to Harris Street for now, that it's not a significant problem and it sounds like this was dealt with very rapidly when it did become an issue for Fisher Street so I guess we just hope that if it does become an issue for us the same thing would happen but with the winter overnight parking ban um, we're, we're in good shape we have not felt a significant impact thank you great thank you is there anyone else for public comment relative specifically to sort of Fisher and Harris streets and that neck of North Amherst it looks like no there isn't um, and so we could take action on things as we go or we could I think we have to close the hearing before we can take action though right mm -hmm. right right yeah they're all lumped together so. right they're all sort of lumped it's usually you have to like one topic we have several so um, let's see was there any other comment from colleagues or anyone relative to the Olympia place and and excuse me, Olympia Drive, I should get that right. Olympia Place is the place that mm -hmm. doesn't have parking because it's where people are. <laughs> Olympia <laughs> Drive has parking because that's an actual place of, that's a street in town. Um, so if not, then I think we'll, we'll take up the topics that were covered by the Downtown Parking Working Group recommendations. And so if any of us had other comments relative to those, then is there anyone from the public that wanted to comment relative to the changes recommended around the taxi stands, the 13 spots off of Kellogg, the addition of a, another 15 minute um, free parking spot, uh, short term parking. Um, I'll take that as a no, since no one's jumping up to come talk to us about that. So. Anything else from our colleagues relative to these topics that we have in front of us tonight? Yes. I just um, forget the date, but a prior select board meeting, you had a first look at these. Um, so now we're formalizing, we're bringing it to a public hearing, which we have to do. So these shouldn't be brand new to select board. We're, we're, we, we did see them in the same, we saw these three suggested changes. That's correct. A couple of meetings ago. Yes. And publicize the public hearing as we have to do. Actually, I think that the, the original memo from the Downtown Parking Work Group was quite a while ago as far as suggested things. These are the final ones that got forwarded to us. But um, I think the only other comment I'm going to offer relative to any of these is that, um, just back to the topic of Olympia Drive, I think that um, I can see the extending of the time period to four hours, but I don't see a need to go beyond that. I think that the point that Ms. Kruger raised about eight hours creating a, a much more complex circumstance than what we intend there, and I think some turnover is okay. Um, so I think that's you know, sort of my only thought that I want to express in, in regard to that. Um, I think there were some comments we got from folks that really we should probably forward to, to the university because I think it has to do with their parking enforcement, and so we should share that with them um, so that they're aware of, of some frustrations that people might be having and and so um, they may not be aware of that so if we could share that with them that would be uh, a good thing I think um, so is there any other comments we want to make or do are we ready to yes I would actually ask if we could pause for just a moment because I have not had a chance to 
review again, although it's actually not new information. It's information that was placed on our desk tonight about the planning board talking about Olympia Drive to just take a moment to refresh my memory of when we read it six months ago um, since we've been provided this again. But I'm thinking it's just since it's all just the information we had before perhaps although it's very thorough and it's help I think it'll be helpful that it gets uploaded to the packet perhaps some of the Olympia Drive residents who've expressed concern will find this of value in terms of understanding where our thoughts are coming from associated with that right well, I guess Mr. Bachman to speak to this more but it's my understanding it it was in the packet but it somehow didn't it was in the electronic it packet is, it, it just fell out we, we were supposed to have it but we didn't get it so it, in fact, I mean, was in the electronic packet. I don't think. I don't think it's in the. I'm we, not sure if it's in the electronic. It was well, supposed. Then, we yeah. were supposed to have it, just to be clear, and we didn't. So, right. you know, because um, it, it relates to what we're talking about for Olympia Drive. So, just to paint that picture a little bit for the audience, since yes. they're not likely to <laughs> be seeing anything. this necessarily, it's many rather a, a, a multi-page um, document, which which uh, goes through, um, uh, you know, the emails from town staff to other town staff relative to uh, requirements of the zoning agreement with uh, the development there at Olympia Drive and what the uh, constraints and requirements of the permit were that required that were relative to parking and so we have a multi-page document that goes through um, a variety of topics but but it was uh, particularly the the record of decision officially from the from the uh, it's the planning board uh, relative to Olympia Drive and the and the place of uh, the, the apartment complex that's called Olympia Place, um, and so those requirements and and restrictions and and ideas behind that. So it's a it's the context of how we got to where we are right now as far as the the thought of what residents of Olympia Place would do relative to parking. And so, um, in short, I think that that the um, given that who was required or who was eligible to live in Olympia Place and availability of university parking, uh, that seemed to satisfy the need for parking in that area in a broad sense, but there were other constraints relative to that um, articulated in this, in this memo. So um, if it's not in our electronic packet, it will be, uh, but it does provide the context yeah. of where we're at. And this is the material that you had in September right. when you set up. Right. Mm -hmm. when but we made. set it up before. Yeah. Right, and, and along those lines, thank you for just pulling that all together for us because I was like, oh right, this is exactly what I recognize from before, the mm -hmm. more I paged yeah. through it. So, and it was really helpful when we had it then to remind ourselves of how things had all come about, as Ms. Kruger also talked about tonight. Um, so I appreciate too what you said, Mr. Slaughter, about forwarding the feedback we did get along to the university mm -hmm. because talking about the cost of the university permit is a UMass issue. Talking about the condition of the lot is a university issue. And also in the other letter talking about enforcement not happening there. So then residents are feeling like people who didn't buy the permit and don't live there are parking there. And so then that's an enforcement issue for UMass, obviously, because it's impacting the quality of life of the residents who live there and have paid for permits. The one thing I am wondering about, and we don't talk about this very much in town because it just kind of sort of works out, is the person who pointed out that there was no clear legal place for delivery drivers to pull up. And as we know, that happens in emergency lanes, et cetera, all over town, which does not mean we're giving tacit approval to that, but um, we haven't yet gotten to the point where we have said developers need to provide a space specifically for that. And if all the meters are full and all of the UMass permits are full, then it does make sense that there is no place for those cars to technically go, although they're only there for a very brief few minutes. So I don't know if anybody had any ideas based on other communities' experience with this issue, but I don't have one, is my point. And I didn't know if Downtown Parking Working Group had talked about that at all, particularly in light of, you know, like, we don't really need taxi stands anymore. We need places for people to pull up for things like Uber. Um, I just don't know how to solve that problem for them. I, 
We're not talking about Olympia. We're talking about the other issue about I the actually, taxi. I am I, talking about Olympia, okay, but I'm referring to... to the taxi places as in we now know we no longer need those spaces as taxi but, stands because, well, one, we don't have licensed taxis in town anymore, but also because that isn't the current model of people providing transportation. So speaking to that, Olymp Olympia Place parking we didn't isn't the parking committee, obviously. It's not right. the purview. So I just wanted to make sure. We yes. Yes. Um, We've talked from time to time about the um, ride-sharing services, Uber, Lyft, and that. Um, they have replaced, to some degree, taxis. Um, and we've looked at, but really didn't spend a lot of time on, pullover spots for those. Um, because the little bit that we looked into it, um, they really didn't want to have an idling spot up by where our particular taxi spots are, but they really do is circle around and I know there were some issues about how how where when they were picking people up but it was something we didn't the parking downtown parking working group didn't feel like we we knew that transportation patterns are changing but we didn't have enough expertise or knowledge to figure out how to address it with within our own scope of work so um, we're, we're happy to have input and ideas. Um, we, we anticipate a parking consulting consultant coming on in the fall. So we, we're not unaware of that shift, but swapping out the taxi places for that, um, the little information we had said that wasn't going to be worthwhile. I think that's useful. Thank you. So do we have other topics or comments that we need to make relative to, to parking. If not, then we can which I perhaps take a motion to close the hearing, and then we can actually take action on those items that are on our list. Of you, I'll, I'll, yes. I'll move that we close the public hearing on parking. All right. Second. So, and there's a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 So the hearing is closed at 731. And so now I would presume that we have actions that we might be ready to take relative to the recommendation, recommendations that have been made to us. So if, if someone would want to offer a motion relative to those, those things. Yes. Why don't I start with the easy one? <laughs> um, so that would be midway through the motions. Move to adopt a year-round no parking tow zone on both the north and south sides of Fisher Street between the hours of 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., seven days a week permanently. Second. All right. There's a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous with one absent. Are we ready for another motion? Sure. So to well, voted unanimously. I'm a little confused rereading the sheet. The motion sheet. The one above is the downtown yeah. parking working group, and that encompasses three actions so all that in one. Takes all three in there. We could separate them out. Yeah, if you want to divide them, I think we should do that. Is there the parking lot off of Kellogg, uh, taxi. next to Anwela, the taxi stand, and the w one parking space uh, that would become? So how would people feel about me saying move to, and then just basically items, read item one, and have that be the actual sure, it's fine. motion? So, for example, we could try move to a move to adopt the recommendation of the downtown parking working group to meter the 13 parking spaces off Kellogg Avenue adjacent to the Ann Whalen apartment parking area on the east side of the parking lot and make them 50 cents an hour with a four-hour time limit. Second. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Yes. Just, um, I think that that's fine for the motion, and I don't think this um, thing I'm about to say has to be included in the motion, but um, it says in the memo from Mr. Bachman will take you know, however many weeks to order the meters and put them in, and I'm wondering if in the interim we could take the tow zone uh, signs down and let people 
park there until they have to start paying to park there because right now it's pretty much empty and it just says you can never park there and that could happen pretty quickly and then we could move towards the metering S start attracting customers now right I think we might need to take that as a separate action perhaps to well, officially do that I don't know no uh, well we never officially authorized those to go up they appear ah. so it's just a suggestion. I think it's a manage, manager's function, but I just, until while we're waiting for the meters, we, we could potentially open that up. Of course, it's summer, so parking's not an issue anyway. Is there a further comment. comment or suggestion on that? So I guess I need some more information because I'm not sure I quite understanding the circumstances here. So. Um, I get the part about the fact that it'll take the meters a while to get there. I get the part about how there's a sign on the fence right now that says you'll be towed away, even though I haven't been yet. And um, we can continue to not enforce that, but it also is also not good to scare people when, in fact, they can go ahead and park there. Um, at the same time, I'm still not clear on the last sentence of Mr. Bockelman's memo, which references a previous conversation we had here about whether or not those meters are going to be included as a place that seniors who've purchased parking stickers from the senior center can park. I know there was some confusion over when and how we did that approval and there was not 100% clear documentation that I remember that we located associated with that. So I think if that's true, that they are not just meters, but they are also meters that seniors can park at with the senior parking permit, just like they can park with the senior parking permit in the Boltwood parking garage, I think we should specify that somewhere in our motion to make that so at least now it's clear going forward, or we should say it's not okay, whichever, I don't care I just think it should be made clearer um, so what the memo says is that given that let's assume that they can park there um, if I have my senior pass to use the bank center under the criteria for that um, and I go and there's available space I can use it with my senior permit if all the spaces are already filled I'll have to look for another one that is eligible to me with a senior pass the downtown parking working group is looking forward to some future set of recommendations that are much more um, kind of holistic that um, look at all the town different parking scenarios um, together so where they might end up <coughs> where, where that might end up um, not necessarily that committee but um, bringing everything under one kind of comprehensive view and management so chose not to review anything to do with the senior parking permits right now, but suggests that it be brought under one unified parking management system. So kind of letting that issue rest for now and not tackling it. So the, the way I read this is you might not get 100% of your projected revenue because some of them may be taken up by seniors with that um, option, but that would presume one that they were all filled all the time and then a non-paying senior was there. So there's a lot of speculation, and I, I would recommend we don't mess with the senior thing until we get to that more holistic view that I hope is coming up over the next year. I don't know if that was clear, rambled. Maybe, we'll see if we agree. <laughs> because what I would like to do in that case is to continue with the understanding that the person who issued those permits gave the seniors who purchased them that that would be one of their alternatives, but that we clearly state in our minutes, therefore, in the document that hasn't been updated in a while of the different kinds of things we do at these hearings associated with parking, it will clearly say that those are spaces that can be used by the senior permit as well, because that is literally the only program we have that allows people to park there without park mobile without putting money in the meter and to just make concrete that that's true and then if mm -hmm. holistically something changes in the future then something changes mm -hmm. in the future but to make sure that's marked in our records that okay. we are understanding that in case there is some confusion in the future as to whether or not that was supposed to be enforced there or not 
I think, having it in our record that at this time we believe we we are saying that the senior permit substitutes for Park Mahomal or the park or putting money in the meter under the conditions that were outlined for its use, which is please don't park here all day, but please park here while you use the senior center. Right. Mr. Steinberg? Yeah. I mean, the other use of the building now that we need to continue to remember is the Musanti Health Center. Right. And uh, because the entrance to the health center is on the lower level, those may in fact be the most um, convenient sp in spaces for people, some who, because of illness or disability, uh, will benefit from uh, those spaces in particular. So I'm not sure that um, we should uh, be assuming that the downtown parking working group is going to assume that those are good spaces for the senior center because they may want to consult with the Musanti Center about its demands um, and needs um, as a part of its investigative process. So I think I might want to hold off on trying to encourage seniors into that lot until we know on the Musanti Center need. So, so the point of my mentioning this in the memo is just to note that this is the status quo, that seniors are able to use this. Unless you vote to change it, it's going to stay the status quo. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if you need to address it unless you want to say, I want for the record to say we are formalizing the, the program that the senior center puts out. So I, I don't, in your motion, you don't mention it. So I don't think you need to mention it if you want to stay, have the status quo continue. Yes. I'm a bit uncomfortable with the status quo since it's not entirely clearly documented that it is the status quo in the past. It is what's being done that doesn't mean we have an obvious place where it was written down that we agreed that that was true. Um, just like we're having this hearing now and this is supposed to get documented not only in our minutes but hopefully on a document that shows changes we've made like this over the years because obviously sorting through the minutes of years and years of parking hearings is much more difficult. So is there, given the length of time those permits are sold for, are those sold on a calendar year basis from January to December? Do we know offhand? I don't know if it's on my head. I don't either. I'll go look at my car because it has one. <laughs> Because my mother-in-law used to have such a permit some years ago when she was still driving. Um, I appreciate that we're not trying to make things more complicated for future discussions. What I do not want to have happen is I do not want the senior center to be advertising those permits in the absence of us having had a discussion once the health center is open. That's what I'm trying to avoid. That and the fact that we don't have clear documentation that we approved it in the first place. So it might be a time limited issue in terms of if they're going to want to they're going to want to issue permits again at some point and knowing what they're for. I would presume if it's like others, it's probably on a fiscal year. So, for example, if you get a sticker for the dump, it's July one. So in the month of July, you have to renew your, your yeah. dump sticker. I don't know if the parking works that way or is. not, but I don't think it does. Um, Ms. Kruger. I mean, I would think the main issue is enforcement. If the enforcement officers are told it, senior um, parking sticker holders are eligible to park here, they're not gonna get ticketed. Um, I think, Ms. Brewer, your point is more like trying to create a, a record, but um, I think until we wanna open the can of worms and really take on, if we're gonna rearrange the senior parking criteria, that we just leave it alone and understand that people with senior passes will park there and they, they will not get tickets because the enforcement officers are gonna be acting under the prior practice. I don't know if that's enough. I mean, I hear, I hear you. So while our minutes can reflect that and the motion doesn't have to say that, and if our, we can feel some assurance that our minutes will say that parking will continue not, parking enforcement will continue not to ticket people who have those because those were the conditions they were sold under, I still want us to talk about a future date so that I believe it was on the calendar year basis because this was earlier this year that we came out in the newsletter. And so if that's true, I can easily see this getting away, them selling the permits again, and then saying, oh, but by the way, now we have the health center demand, so you can't park there anymore. I, I feel less comfortable 
selling something to somebody and then changing where it's good for. But I put it on a future agenda list. Mm -hmm. The minutes could reflect that. We really would be capable of doing that. And then having a follow-up um, in, in December, for have, example. Have let the senior users and senior center right. users have plenty of notice that we were, that was under consideration. That it was under if consideration. Was, yeah. Or if it just continues for a whole other year and we, we evaluate after a year of the health center being open, and, that sort of thing. And I think they sell them basically on a rolling basis. I, th I think that's a reasonable solution and we should just go forward with the motion as stated and so we can complete this work and get onto the marijuana issues. Right. So is there further discussion, which I'm guessing it's not on this. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? So that's unanimous with one absent. So um, we have a couple other parts to the recommendation from the downtown parking working group so if someone wants to offer those motions. So I move to adopt the recommendation of the downtown parking working group to eliminate the five taxi parking spaces along the east side of South Pleasant Street at the North at the North Common. Second. So motion has been made. Is there further discussion on the taxi stands? Um, the only other th the other thing though Ms. Brewer is uh, to add to your motion um, anything that we need about um, metering and length of metering that's what i was trying to read again they're already metered. they're already metered mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so it just eliminates the uh, the, uh, the only thing that they're eliminating is from 11 p.m to 2 a.m okay the yes the memo says 11 p.m to 2 p.m but it means to 2 a.m mm, right. um the may 14th mem right. no it, it was a may typo you don't have to take credit for that one <laughs> um which really just means that no one who was putting meters, no one was putting money in meters at 11 o'clock at night to right. begin so, with. But this is letting people know that, for example, unlike the loading situation, right, where people are reading the hours, am I allowed to park and when this is not a lo commercial loading zone, right. there's no longer a sign there that says that, and it'll just be like it never happened. Is that correct? It'll just have meters and it'll just be normal and they'll just be normal hours with normal costs. And okay. So it's really a kind of a cleanup because it's, um, it doesn't affect revenue because we're not collecting meter money then anyway. Um, I know for somebody like me who's sort of nearsighted when I see taxi stand, I'm, I'm probably right. not even able to read the six to two or whatever it is, 11 to two. So it's, it seems to be kind of an inhibitor rather than a welcoming right. that's equal to all other spaces on that street because right. it's not being right. used now. So if his motion wasn't seconded, I do second it. Okay, I, be I believe it was, but we've locked that in. So <laughs> okay. is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous with one absent as well. And so if we could have. And then I could say, I move to adopt the recommendation of the Downtown Parking Working Group to add a second 15 minute free parking space on the east side of the Boltwood lot off of Kellogg Avenue. Second. All right. Is there further discussion on that one? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous with one absent as well. So do we have, let's have let me drive. So we have one item remaining, correct? Mm -hmm. correct. Okay. So we're ready and for so minutes. I could move to increase the parking time limit for the 33 parallel parking spaces as shown on the sketch dated June 20th. Is it really still 2017? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, thank you. From two hours to four hours, and I took off eight hours as recommended by the town manager. I just said from two hours to four hours. Is there a second? Second. Yes, so for the discussion, so I'll let. So this right says now. nothing about rates. So this would be, I believe, at four hours at 50 cents an hour. Um, it wasn't really part of the motion. We could add that. Um, how do people, f are we content with 50 cents versus, what's your mass on dollar fifty an hour, dollar twenty-five an hour? Um, I know people aren't using it now, so we're not collecting revenue, we're collecting tickets, and that's not a long-term pattern that we'd like. I'm not sure I have a strong preference. Although it is a, you know, 
I would suggest that you know in the downtown the idea was the dollar rate at the, the at the spots mm -hmm. we want to turn over the most often mm -hmm. and at those spots that aren't we have a lower rate and longer time window so I think this falls into that category so I would be inclined to stay with the same rates and with a four-hour window um, but, Question yeah. um, for Mr. Bachman: Is this going to be? Is this a Park Mobile zone as well? It is. Yeah. Okay. It is a Park Mobile. I just <clears throat> haven't been up there to check on it. So, is there further discussion? Yes. Ms. So I suppose then one of the questions would be, and obviously we are somewhat just making this up, <laughs> although we also have some expertise based on the idea that downtown parking working group looked at this and, and made those zones that we referred to is that if what we're trying to do is discourage people from parking there to go to class then a dollar an hour is a better choice than 50 cents an hour if what we're trying to do is to be more kind to people who are just trying to visit their friends and looking for a place to park then 50 cents an hour seems more appropriate so I guess in the other problem the other challenge would be if we start with 50 and we still find that they are constantly full and there is no place for visitors to park during the time that UMass enforces um, parking um, in the rest of the lot, that maybe we could revisit it. So that that seems like another alternative. Right. Fine. That's fine. Anything to add, Mr. Steinberg? No, I think that I agree <laughs> so with that we're good. So yeah. at this point, why don't I, shall we go ahead and add mm -hmm. to the motion to continue at the rate of 50 cents per hour? So it's it from good. two hours to four hours at 50 cents an hour. 50 cents. Remaining at 50 mm -hmm. cents an hour. I'm just trying to show for the record yep. that we didn't change that. Remaining at 50 cents an hour. For now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so that's unanimous with one absent. Thank you. So I believe that. That's taking us through the completes the parking. Can we take a for tonight? Three minute recess. Yes, we'll take a short recess, recess and then we'll head into our next topic, which will be on the marijuana topic. Move our many pounds of paper on parking. Right. We'll take a short break. certain urgency by making them wait a little bit. <laughs> started so it's likely we have both I have it for the 24th because uh, that's the day oh, he wants to get some big the police in We're gonna scrimmage that evening actually. yeah so the morning would be fine yes yeah, we'll the morning's fine but like that evening yeah that evening so. they want to do a thing and he's got commitment from fire right so I don't know if he's heard from Scott yet I think he said yes did he oh good yeah they want to do a kind of fundraiser scrimmage kind of thing is a fundraiser too? Always. <laughs> <laughs> Any opportunities. <laughs>
going to come up. Jeff, you guys want to kick off? Easy parking stuff. I didn't get into any hard stuff. <laughs> right. That was the easy one. All right, so we're back from our short recess. So next on our agenda under action and discussion items is 4B, which is marijuana update. Uh, a couple of topics underneath that. Mr. Kravitz is here to guide us through uh, his memo and, and thoughts on the matter. And so if you'd like to share with us what you're thinking was. And sure. So, um, the memo was in response to uh, a lot of interest from potential uh, recreational marijuana retailers in town. Um, I think that town staff didn't necessarily feel comfortable that we had a good process for whether or not to sign a host community agreement. Um, no real way of evaluating uh, the, the companies that were approaching the town on whether or not they had a good track record, a good business plan, um, things like that. So essentially, sort of a, a, I'll call it a potential quick fix, was to say that Amherst residents voted for recreational marijuana. Um, basically the memo proposed allowing the medical marijuana dispensaries to also um, service the recreational market and then to implement a local licensing um, process which would help the town understand the viability of other potential recreational marijuana retailer businesses in town. Um, without some sort of process, uh, we felt that it would create a, a race that could potentially be a race to the bottom. The quickest ones to open would be the ones that get to open. Um, and if they're located in close proximity to each other, it would effectively knock others out. There's also the potential that businesses would invest significant sums of money and then not ultimately be able to open because somebody else was able to get there faster. So we're trying to avoid the situation where um, businesses are out a lot of money and aren't able to operate in Amherst. And so this was a, a potential solution. Um, by no means do I think that it is an ideal solution, but it is a solution um, that at least would allow recreational marijuana, which is something the voters said that they wanted in Amherst. Um, and because the medical marijuana dispensaries have gone through the Department of Public Health um, registration process, gone through all the security measures to open medically, gave the town some confidence that they were um, responsible operators and, and not something that we would be as concerned about um, as far as others, that we would have to sign a host community agreement um, as an initial step before they even apply to the state. So we don't have any of the application materials that the select board, I believe, was um, privy to when they signed their letters of support for the medical dispensaries. Okay. So, so just to frame that a little bit, so for the viewers, everybody, there's medical and then there's recreational. Right now, we have one medical marijuana facility that opened on May 21st and is currently operating. Uh, we have three others that have received letters of non-opposition and support from the host community and host community agreements signed by the, ta by the town manager. Um, one medical marijuana facility is seeking a new letter of non-opposition support to substitute the one already issued. Um, and three have special permits from the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that, that, those four facilities are sort of working their way through a process. One has actually opened. And there's a chart that was in your packet that summarizes the medical. Uh, Mr. Kravitz put together a new chart for, for recreational, which is a different world. And those, that's, it was the recreational new world that we're trying to address and think about. Um, it's changing. There was an article in the, the Attorney General's changing her mind and how she's interpreting some things. So um, things are changing uh, day by day. But there are, as evidence tonight, there are people who are eager to open facilities in the town of Amherst and hoping to have a discussion with you about um, 
how we should be proceeding. The town meeting uh, adopted zoning that uh, identifies that there will be eight recreational marijuana facilities um, that will be available, but that there are geographic limits on where they can be placed and how in the proximity to certain facilities where children congregate on a regular basis, for instance, that they can um, where they can be placed. So. Um, seeing that that we are a welcome generally a welcoming community i think the industry is looking for some guidance from the board and from the town as to where can we go to do to do this because this is a legal um as of july 1 this will be a legal um, product for us to sell so that's the discussion we thought was important to have with you tonight so i look to our do you want to start ms kirk to sort of you want me to start so you can tell me how incorrect I am. <laughs> okay, I will just I will I will try. So, as select board members know, and perhaps some members of the public know, and certainly has been discussed at town meeting associated with the multiple um, bylaws that we have passed at town meeting associated with marijuana use, we keep looking at a safe and deliberate implementation of a legal product that our community overwhelmingly supported. Um, in doing so, I would argue they overwhelmingly supported decriminalizing recreational adult use. They did not overwhelmingly support having it in every possible place in town, which is one of the reasons we came up with the various um, proposals associated with numbers and with the zoning that was worked on so hard by the planning board and presented to town meeting on multiple occasions. And town meeting agreed with it. On our agenda, it says we need our specific things mentioned, specifically called out in addition to just you know update in general, is local licensing and letters of support or non-opposition. So one of the things this memo talks about is, you know, what's happening and then also the fact that we have not as a board partly because we were looking at the potential change in government etc talked about the possibility of whether or not we're going to sign any additional letters of support or non-opposition for an additional medical facility which includes one that has asked for us to do so which is at a location which we had previously provided one for but also then at the same time we're really trying to shift our emphasis to the eight retail locations. And when we say eight establishments that we established at town meeting, those are the retail establishments. And as, as Mr. Mackelman points out and has been discussed elsewhere, talking about testing, cultivation, research, and manufacturing, which are allowed in some places in town, those aren't part of the eight. They all have to have host community agreements. They're just all slightly different kinds of host community agreements, and we don't have an example one yet as to what it looks like because everybody's building this plane as we're flying it. And so I appreciate the town council's been working on it, and that's one of the things we look to KP Law for is because they work, they work with so many different communities. So I know that we, we have talked about all the multiple issues associated with this in the internal working group at our multiple, multiple meetings, and some of those have, we've come to some areas of consensus and some just amongst that small working group and in other areas we, we really haven't. And so we thought it was entirely appropriate, especially after this memo of May 14th um, came out, that we try and have another public discussion about this in a way that we haven't done in these sort of both general and detailed terms since last fall when we had a specific time set aside at a select board meeting to talk about marijuana before we got to town meeting but then and then we also had the big town meeting discussion before town meeting about the articles and we had the discussion before town meeting about the articles this time but in terms of all the other things that aren't subject to being town meeting articles what do we do? And so I totally appreciate Mr. Kravitz needing to work with Mr. Bockelman and say, you know, we're getting phone calls on a daily basis. How do we deal with this? And at the same time, I don't know exactly what our community is expecting from us in terms of how to answer all those questions. So I appreciate that there was also Mr. Kravitz, even though we didn't talk about it at last week's internal working group meeting, came up with these additional figures as to all the different things that people have been asking about and shows all the different types of marijuana, things like cultivator, product manufacturer, testing lab, 
that have already called us. We are all aware, because we've talked about it at select board meetings, that community outreach meetings have been held by two of the medical marijuana places that are looking at doing recreational adult use. And while I appreciate the comment made earlier that having all the materials we did when we did the support and non-opposition letters, which were all support letters, that that material is not necessarily available to the town manager who signs all the host community agreements before the host community agreement would be signed on a recreational. It's also true that all the things they talk about, or I should say, 98% of the things that the two meetings I was at that were community outreach meetings that were talked about in terms of things the organizations were planning to do were all things they were required to do by the state. They were not, oh, and here's these amazing extra things we're going to do. They're all required, and so all the security and all that is all really detailed in the state rules. And so the question is more, what do we want that we think is special Amherst flavor to add to things. And that brings us back to the host community agreement and or Board of Health regulations, which of course are completely independent of this body end of town meeting, um, and the conditions put forth in a special permit, because there does have to be a separate special permit for recreational adult use, even if it's already on the site as medical. So even if it's the same building, they need a separate special permit for the recreational adult use. And so Mr. Moore has been incredibly helpful in coming to these many of these internal working group meetings as well. And we're sorry I couldn't be here tonight, but he will be available on July 9th. So I'm thinking, you know, I don't know how far we'll get with tonight's conversation, but there may very well be questions that come up that we want to ask him directly or that people want to get to Mr. Bachman ahead of time to get to him so that he could answer for us at that meeting as to, for example, what conditions would look like. My underlying concern beyond not knowing what the community wants um, exactly, and we've kind of struggled with that all along, we didn't get a lot of turnout to our previous conversation about this, is that we are the local licensing authority right now for alcohol, Board of Health is for tobacco. One of the things we fought for at all the different hearings we went to, all the times we had public comments, whether it was Mr. Kravitz, Ms. Kruger, myself, Ms. Breaststrap, Ms. Fetterman, everybody went to all these things. And one of the things we would continually bring up is we wanted the ability to have some level of local licensing, just like we do with tobacco for the Board of Health, just like we do for alcohol for the Select Board of Local Licensing Authority. We never really knew what we were exactly going to put in it. <laughs> and so that's where it starts to get complicated. And so trying to figure out if the other instruments we have, like Board of Health regs, and conditions in a special permit are enough. And one of the concerns I have associated with that is that all of those decisions are made by appointed officials. So the host community agreement never came to the select board, I mean, starting before this town manager, never came to the select board for any input. It's not our job. It's the town manager's authority, clearly. But there was no discussion as to what was going to go in. And they were kind of rote, but still, we didn't really know what the possible levers were to pull anyway within the thing, because it was still so new. Um, that remains true for the recreational adult use. So again, it's entirely up to the town manager, and it will remain entirely up to the town manager under the future form of government. Right now, the select board appoints the Zoning Board of Appeals. It's not elected. The Board of Health is not elected in the future. Board of Health will still not be elected, will be appointed by the town manager as it is now, and the ZBA will continue to be appointed by the town council. But that's not quite the same as when we've had town meeting looking at it as another elected official and as this group of five also working with the town manager because the town council in the future will not be part of the executive branch, they'll be part of the legislative branch. So it feels like if we don't get some sense now, while this is a time sensitive issue because in theory people are going to start getting their approvals from the state any day now for July 1st, then we are going to miss our opportunity to have input as elected officials that the community has entrusted to do this with and put it all entirely on appointed officials and I just don't know if 
we're quite ready to do that, given all the advocacy we've, we've done up to this point and what we think that might look like. Brewer? I'll try to speak to a couple of different points than what Ms. Brewer covered. Um, my concern about um, this sort of advisory memo um, that Mr. Kravitz put together, and I agree there isn't a perfect answer, and I, I appreciate the struggle of people calling you and you're not knowing what, you know, it shouldn't just be first in the door. However, I, I'm not sure either of these memos, it tells me how we are gonna proceed to differentiate one proposal from another. We talked, we threw some ideas around at the last um, working group meeting, Mr. Bachman was there, but I don't know how this gets us any closer to having a qualitative criteria or uh, a strategy. So what I worry about is when we, when we set the ceiling at eight, so up to eight for now, um, we didn't want to give the existing four medical license at that time applicants like a lock on uh, the recreational because the state gave them a way to um, go from medical to recreational even though they'd still need a special permit and a separate agreement. I'm worried that this is kind of within our kind of open door approach, we're creating a mini moratorium within what we've set up because we're saying the four we have for medical could transition under the current state rules to recreational and maybe that's enough for now and we don't have to go any further for maybe another year. And so it gives those four a benefit and um, I, I think I, I'm less than happy with that, although I would like more qualitative criteria for how we differentiate the proposals that we're getting and how to set something like that up. I think I'm in favor of local licensing, but I don't think the licensing is necessarily a qualitative criteria. I think it's another enforcement tool, it's sort of, you got your special permit, you got your host agreement, you're in, but if you screw up, you could lose your license, and the license is another tool. Um, but you don't go through the whole um, application process and then say, oh, we don't like you, you don't get your license, because I don't think that's fair to, to business people either. Um, I think we do need to try to articulate what we want. If there's competition for a couple of possible downtown spaces, how to articulate what we're really looking for so we can differentiate. And um, I'm probably of the, of the people in the working group more embracing of the idea that we are branding ourselves as a welcoming community for this new industry. And I'm worried that by saying, oh yeah, but we're just going with the four or the three for now, um, is counter to having that kind of um, welcoming uh, attitude or, or projection. So I very much want to hear from people who are here to, here to comment because I don't have an answer and I think we're at a place where we need to make some decisions and we also need to decide are we going to entertain any more support non-oppositional -oppos letters for medical knowing that we're really getting recreational. That it's the uh, it's the easy path in, and I, fortunately, I don't have any confidence that because someone got a medical license, it means we know them and they pass some more rigorous tests. Because the test for recreational is pretty rigorous, so I, that by itself isn't convincing to me. But uh, I want to, I want to think about these issues. It's don't have a ready answer. I would just add that the. Cannabis Control Commission is working their way through the priority applicants right now. I, I don't know, I didn't check today how many licenses <laughs> they've issued. I know they issued their first license, but it, it's not unreasonable to think that if, if we were serious about setting up a licensing process, that it would be, we would be able to do that in time for the CCC when they start um, accepting applications for non-priority applicants likely sometime in the fall, if that would make you feel any better, but I understand the concerns mm -hmm. as well. Mr. Steinberg, did you have anything you wanted to offer at this point? No, I think I'll wait until <laughs> later after I've heard from more mm -hmm. from the public. Okay. So I think that the only thing I'd offer at this point as far as my thinking about this <clears throat> 
in particular is that you know we've we've created you know in similar fashion to liquor licenses where they actually in some towns get sold from one sort of you know uh, establishment to another one we've, we've almost created a circumstance of a similar nature here by having an upper limit of eight um, but I do think having criteria and I, I, I think licensing might serve this purpose but I think the you know to your point about sort of does it you know sort of bait and switch someone if they've gone through the other hoops in the process they've done a host community agreement they've done a they've gotten the special permit you know and then we go oh but never mind about that i think that it's critical for us if we do a licensing to have a set of rules that we're trying to apply uh and and not that they necessarily have a, a perfect point system or something like that but some some relatively um clear uh you know either goals or or criteria that we're looking for from from someone and I do to to Ms. Brewer's point I do think the notion of having uh, you know an elected body sort of weigh in on that is important because I think there's uh, a level of control and a level of of uh, sort of community authority that that grants um, the process that that appointed folks it's not that they're not attuned to that, but they're not as beholden to that as a, as elected officials are. So I think there's some, you know, it can that can work both ways in some respects. But I think that those are all critical things. And I think about well, what what would be those criteria? What are the things we're trying to think about? You know, we've articulated from a zoning standpoint how we're trying to uh, insulate certain areas from from the business to some extent, um, and then how do we create as fair a playing field as possible to to Mr. Kravitz's point about, you know, is it a first come first serve or is it, you know, a more thoughtful process? And so I've, I'm struggling with that to some extent, but I also am thinking about things that I, I think are important to the, to putting in our criteria. But um, did you have anything you wanted to offer, Mr. Bachman? So I think at this point, given that I think my colleagues are wanting to hear from the public at large, and it seems as though we have an audience for that purpose, uh, uh, given that there are people here tonight. And they didn't talk about parking, and they didn't come to our regular public comment part, so I presume you're here for this. Um, are there any folks in the audience that wanted to offer comment or suggestion relative to, to this topic and, and the idea of, of licensing or, or, for that matter, any other related marijuana topic? So I'm open to taking people's comments. So sure, if you come up, just make sure to identify yourself with the microphone and, and, uh, and offer your, your comment and suggestion relative to that. Hello, uh, Frank Perulo from Lewis Wharf in Boston. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and select board members. Thank you, Manager Bockelman. I'm here to speak on behalf of Jane Hammon, CEO of Herbology Group. <clears throat> Herbology has worked to cite a cannabis establishment serving both medical patients and adult use customers <clears throat> in Amherst since the end of last year. I'm here to advocate for the issuance of a medical letter of non-opposition. Herbology Group has met with the various town officials who have oversight of cannabis establishments presented in front of this board and presented to, a community, uh, to the community at a public meeting. And we have, uh, or we would agree, to sign a host agreement for the maximum allowed by state law. I would also urge this board to look at things like excise tax and preference for local hiring, uh, all things that we've seen in other um, host community agreements. Uh, excise tax on vehicles working out of the, uh, the site. <clears throat> Herbology Group is a minority and veteran-owned nonprofit invited to siting by DPH and ready to purchase the property at 422 Amity and start serving medical patients and adult use customers, consumers responsibly. We will not do either or. It's our preference to do both. We are committed to the medical market, and that's a commitment that we, we stand by and we're, we're, we're going to stick to. At a previous meeting, this board <clears throat> had a discussion regarding the previous letter of non-opposition given to Happy Valley Ventures at the very same site. The siting profile has expired for Happy Valley Ventures and is no longer an impediment to issuing a new letter in, in our view. The Herbology Group is hoping this board can offer a letter of non-opposition, um, as have the nearby towns of East Hampton and Greenfield to Herbology Group. We 
we want to continue the discussion. We will hold another public meeting, another community meeting, as we promised. Uh, we want to be that trusted community partner in local business, providing the well-paying jobs and revenues for the town of Amherst that uh, we know this law will provide. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Are there others here for public comment relative to the topic? I'm Steve George. <clears throat> I'm on the Board of Health, but I'm speaking as an individual with interest in it. Uh, a couple of things that we've noticed in attending the um, open meetings of, of uh, people seeking approval, uh, I agree with what Ms. Brewer said about uh, they are only talking about what is mandated. And one thing the Board of Health is very interested in is the educational aspects for the pr provision of educational materials for the clients. Um, and how that's going to work. It's possible that the town would provide it, and perhaps there's some economic reason for that, or there would be an expectation of the, uh, for the um, businesses to provide this. But the issue of diversion to minors, uh, the security of the materials once you've got them home and so on, is there's a real issue that needs to be addressed at, at the point of sale, at least the first time somebody buys. <clears throat> so that's one issue. And another thing that the Board of Health I know, has been concerned about is edibles. And the, our understanding, I guess, is that at least originally, these were not going to be considered as food from the point of view of regulation. I think that may have changed. But um, the issue of, especially if things are produced and you know, cooked and, and packaged in the town of Amherst, this is really a food issue. And uh, uh, it seems like it, it might be possible for it to kind of escape all regulation uh, if we're understanding the rules correctly. Um, things that come from outside that are already packaged may not be so much a problem, but when if any of the, um, of the outlets plan to actually bake and, and provide uh, this as food, it seems like it should be dealt with in the same way as food that is provided to the public and that's, that's cooked and provided um, on site. So those are two of the issues that uh, the Board of Health was concerned with. We certainly totally agree with what the town has done. And I think that in some other towns, the boards of health have been more uh, activist on this issue because at the, uh, the council level or, or select board level, there's been a more lax approach. But the Amherst has done a really great job, especially with the zoning and so on. So we have no concerns about that at all and the, and the limit on the number. Thank you. Is there additional public comment? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst. Um, you notice Matt Yee is in the back, uh, president of the Massachusetts market for GTI, now RISE. Um, and really, they're the only medical operator here in town. Uh, they were the second to get to the to get the permit um, first to market. We have been working closely with the town at every turn. Um, probably one of those folks that Mr. Kravitz mentioned calls uh, almost daily to find out where we are in the process because um, GTI RISE is a priority applicant. Timing is crucial. Um, and one of the things that they're looking for is um, timely action by the town. And so whether that's the institution or development of a policy, um, articulation of criteria, um, getting to that next step for the, the host community agreement pretty specifically. Uh, we had a pre-application meeting with uh, town planner, building commissioner, Mr. Kravitz, um, and also the senior planner for the Zoning Board of Appeals, discussing the 169 Meadow Street site because there is and has been interest in co-locating, so to have medical and recreational at that uh, facility. And so really what we're looking for is the most certainty we can get from the town, at least laying out the rules um, and as quickly as they can do it. I know that there's also interest in downtown locations, and I think that's what Mr. Kravitz suggests when there may be a race. And I think it's not necessarily good for the town, and it's not necessarily good for the applicant to try to race um, just to be first um, or to expend all the funds and, and not be in there at all. So whatever this board can do 
to as clearly as they can articulate the requirements if there is a policy or if there's not a policy just to really give us on this side of the table as much predictability and certainty as you can we'd really appreciate it thank you for that anyone else wanting to offer comment relative to this topic all right so now I turn back to my colleagues <laughs> see if there's comment that they want to make or thoughts about next steps I would take that as well I was just gonna bring up a typo I want you to do something <laughs> substantive um, unfortunately on the status of Amherst recreational marijuana establishment applicants June 22nd so that's the newer chart the one we haven't seen a bunch of times um, the rise address was a cut and paste from a different place <laughs> so, yeah so it is 169 Meadow Street and the other community outreach meeting that's been held is by herbology for the 422 Amity Street site the formerly um, Happy Valley mr. Steinberg yeah I mean there have been several questions that have been raised uh, by the comments and things that I've been thinking about uh, because one is a uh, question of the role of the Board of Health and um, what we might be able to do or want to do to formalize a structure for uh, permitting as indicated, I think, by Mr. Kravitz for either the Board of Health or the Council of eventually the Select Board uh, during the um, interim period of transition. So there's that set of issues. Uh, we had somebody who raised the question, uh, the herbology applicant, and request for the letter. And I don't know if we're prepared to take that discussion tonight since it was not specifically on the agenda. I think that's a matter for the chair to determine what's the uh, uh, appropriateness of that discussion taking place further tonight. Um, and then the other is, I think, generally a question of how quickly we should move forward and the advantages of moving forward so that we can provide clarity and encourage applicants within the community and um, for all of the, there were, uh, there were reasons stated um, by uh, Mr. Kravitz. There is a counter um, question, however, and that's the it gets back to the charter all over again and um, that uh, it's generally our direction from the um, charter that we not act um, unless there's um, a specific reason to do so and there's a specific standard which I'm not quoting here um, but there's also a question that was on my mind, and I don't know if Mr. Kravitz has looked into this, and that is um, there's a provision under the charter for uh, the Board of License Commissioners or whatever the exact title is, and uh, there was certain definitions of what was to be included within their area of responsibility, that particular board, and. Uh, trying to read it to determine whether um, the, the um, marijuana licensure issue is vested in in that particular board by the charter or is left where it is now and have you looked at that at all Mr. Kravitz I, I mean, I know that there's a board of licensed commissioners um, and didn't see if marijuana was specifically mentioned, but just sort of assumed that that they would get first crack at any um, licensing. Um, do you know what statutory chapter the marijuana is under? 
So I can answer your question. Yes, the charter does give the Board of License Commissioners the authority to talk about marijuana if there is any local licensing of marijuana. It is very specifically in the charter, and they did, in fact, attempt to call out the statute in one of the other sections, but it's definitely on page. So uh, just to clarify, there there is no one right now who is the local licensing authority for marijuana. There isn't anybody. What there is, is there's a select board that does alcohol, because that's what we do under our, the previous charter, and there's a board of health that does tobacco. But there is not a local licensing authority, there is no direct line like there is for ABC C to say your local licensing authority is your select board in this case because your charter doesn't differentiate from that and or doesn't di diverge from that. And so since our new charter says marijuana goes under there, that doesn't mean they'll actually have any local licensing authority because there has not yet been anything put forward by the CCC, if you want to try and look at it as the equivalent of the ABCC, that says, and here's your responsibility. We just kept saying we wanted to have some room, but they did not come up with a thing that was like that. Well, I think it's, it's always um, wise for us to go back and look at the charter and the transition provisions with almost everything we do, because right. that, that makes sense to me, but we're not stopping issuing liquor licenses or common victualler licenses in the interim. And I think this is somewhat equivalent. I don't think it's fair um, to have ongoing businesses wait um, what we and say, I, we're going to wait till the council is seated and, and do this, that we have this responsibility in the meantime. Um, right now, we don't have local licensing. So that's a, that's a decision. You might argue that deciding to have local licensing should be left for the commit the uh, council or not, but we don't have that. So it's not who's going to give the license. It's about who's going to give the letter. Are we, is this board going to give any more letters of support or non-opposition for medical knowing that that, op that means they can co-locate? Um, we got to a place where we sort of got to this limbo on that issue and herbology came in and we went into our town meeting cycle and we didn't decide and I think uh, the question is, are we open to considering and perhaps, we don't have to do it, issue, uh, issue a letter of support or non-opposition, which is the same letter because it open, it's the ticket to go to the CCC. Um, so we have um, a holder of that letter. Somebody tonight said it's expired. I don't really have any information about that, but there's a way we could, if we wanted to, issue a letter to uh, uh, a different applicant for that same site. Um, there's ways to finesse. I mean, we, can't, we don't want to have two people holding the letter for the same site, but there's a way to do it. So I think we at least have to answer the question about whether we're going to go back and review that and either issue or not issue that letter. I don't, uh, for me, that, that's not something that gets left for the council, but whether we want to venture into designing a licensing system and adopting it, um, I, I don't know how essential that is right now, just like Board of Health regs um, might come into play at some point. But we have a pretty robust system right now for managing um, the medical and the future recreational establishments that are coming along. So I see it as kind of our job to wade in and figure out, are we going to give letters for any more medical, just the same as for recreational, really? Um, and what's our position on how um, quickly we want to give out the rest of the up to eight um, post agreements, or do we want to have some qualitative criteria? And if we wait for the council and, and say, well, that's theirs, those criteria could wait till next spring, and uh, applicants have options to go to other communities. And uh, I just think we need to decide and let. It's only fair to let people know where we're at about all that. We've been hanging and not deciding for a while. So that makes me, that begs a couple of questions for me personally relative to this. And, and so first is are in some ways independent of the transition, our authority to create a local license. Do we have that authority or do we need, um, in other words, in general, separate of the topic, can we create a local license for 
sort of anything? And I presume yes, yes is the answer to that. So I think the other thing for me relative to that is if that is the case, which I presume it is, that you know the timeline for uh, adult use uh, at the state level is going to be earlier than the transition to, to the council. So I think in some ways it, we have to put some frame in place. Um, I think we're going to, if, if we think licensing is a, is a good idea, and I personally am leaning toward the idea that, yes, we should. We should have some process that provides some clarity about some, some things that aren't going to be tackled by Board of Health per se, not going to be tackled by zoning, not necessarily going to be tackled or, or uh, incorporated into a host community agreement. I think there is another area of, of uh, and, you know, that, that a local licensing, you know, sort of fills. Uh, a set of questions there, and I and I think so. We I think, in my opinion, we're going to have to move in that direction, even if it's to just get an initial frame that can then be built upon by a council, which I think is probably likely to be the case. But I think just given the timelines of when the CCC is going to start issuing licenses, even if it's you know even if they don't offer any to anything but medical currently medical ones, even if they don't do any of those. And I mean, if, if they only do those for the next six to eight months, I think it still behooves us to, to put our, our process in place, at least to get an initial start on that. So that's kind of the direction I'm leaning at this point in time is that I think we will need to take some action because I think inaction puts us in a situation where someone's going to press because we don't have local licensing, then you, you know, they're going to want to open and there's nothing, if we don't put something in place, I don't think we can just say no forever. We can't. They, they, if they get the other pieces of the puzzle, they could potentially just open their doors with adult use mm -hmm. if we don't. I, That's not accurate. No, no. So they I've can't. I've heard anything uh, that says that they that, they need that a host community them. agreement. Right. So that would be the only stopgap. Would be the host community agreement. Mm -hmm. which, which is another option that that the host community agreement is the gatekeeper mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, applicants need to demonstrate through the host community agreement and whatever criteria or standards that um, we all come up with that, that they meet or exceed those. And then the host community agreement gets signed for those that, that seem reasonable. Right, but at this point in time, is if, if he were to sign one tomorrow for, rec for adult use, that'll, there is then no more mm -hmm. right. place to stop exactly. that. Exactly. Absolutely That's true. Right. Exactly. So I mean, obviously that well, that would be at your risk. <laughs> well, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's there's the well, special uh, well, right, and the zoning for the special there's permit would also be here. another. Those two pieces, though, are the only current stops once the state has authorized uh, the adult use, unless we set up some structure that fills in that that other area potentially that we're talking about. And so, I think, sorry, go ahead, please. Um, if if we do have local licensing, then would would the town sort of just sign host community agreements with more than eight operators, knowing that only eight can operate, and it would be up to the local licensing authority and the permit granting authority to say, oh, you're the ninth applicant, we're not going to... Because then the host community agreement, if, if it's a standard agreement, there can be more signed than we anticipate. Um, actually operating. So uh, a couple things. One is we've been asked, that, and I think this is a legitimate request, that we bring some rationality to the system that's unstable. And so what we've put an enormous amount of time in, especially two members of the select board and the, and the staff who've been working on this, is to think through very diffi you know, difficult, challenging things that a moving world and trying to bring some rationality to it. So that's that's what the, the industry is asking for us. And I think our, 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 our people who live in the community are saying, well, what is the what is the path forward if we want to take a path forward? And I think that um, I think part of the path forward, I mean, I know there's a differentiation between elected and appointed officials. It's going to be appointed officials who are making most of the decisions. The licensing commission is going to be appointed officials. If there is a licensing commission, town manager is an appointed official. Um, most of all the permitting, you know, the planning board and zoning board are appointed officials. So um, elected officials are critical in setting the tone and the direction for what we want to accomplish. 
And I think that's why this is a really, really important discussion tonight because I need direction from you before taking, you know, as you said, going on your own risk because that's not where I want to be. I want to be that we're unified as a, as a community and you are the ones that are really um, uh, hold the, the decision making on where we want to go as a community. So I think where you wind up is where we will go. So that's, that's the key piece. Um, and I know that there's been, the, the licensing is, is an optional. We don't have to have licensing if we don't want. The, but the key piece is the host community agreement. And I'm not going to sign a host community agreement until I'm clear with where the board wants to be as a general policy place in terms of where, we, where, where we're going. Um, I think Ms. Kruger pointed up the first one, which is we do owe the people from Herbology an answer. Like we're going, the select board is going to offer the letter of non-opposition or support or not. You should just be clear and offer that. And maybe we schedule that and say, you guys can, it's, I don't think it's right to do it tonight. I don't think we've advertised it. Um, but I think that that is a responsibility that you should embody at some point in the relatively near future. Uh, in terms of where we go for the recreational piece, um, I think that's a, um, uh, a more difficult one. The path that I think Mr. Kravis laid out was to say, well, we already know we've, ad we've identified four locations for um, medical, so we sort of know we've already made some decisions on that, so let's say okay to those four and sort of hold off on the others um, until we get more information down the road. And we also at our last meeting talked about doing small steps. You know, it's a, we don't wanna push everything directly over the line right into Hadley, which will happen if we take no steps. Um, but we also don't wanna like full heartedly go into a, uh, embrace an industry that is, is, is running around trying to figure out its own path too. It's a maturing industry. Nobody really knows where it's going. So it's a really uncertain time. It's really difficult for public officials like you to, to grapple with these things. But I think it's really important for, for you to do so. If I could, I'm gonna ask one sure. hopefully quick question. Of the communities that surround us, you know, sort of geographically touch us, how many of those, so that'd be, you know, Leverett, Shutesbury, Sunderland, Hadley, Belchertown, I don't think I missed any. How many of them have moratoriums and do any of them not Granby have a moratorium? Touch, I think Granby, Granby, Granby us. actually does as well. Um, I think South Hadley has one is the closest. So the others do not have a moratorium <laughs> that you're aware of? Not, I want to say that Lever brought it up at the town meeting, okay. but I, I don't remember what the... Because if they did, that would change the conversation and sort of in, as far as the, the question of whether something's going to go across town line. And if there's not a moratorium, then it very likely is. But I, I will say that Northampton did sign a host community agreement with um, New England Treatment Access, which is the medical dispensary there. So they do seem open to recreational. For recreational. Marijuana. Yeah. Yeah. For recreational. Okay. I could uh, just maybe make a suggestion. Um, well, first, I think we should plan to schedule um, in the near term the um, herbology um, meeting and discussion and with the idea that we'll try to be ready to make make a decision one way or the other but I'm wondering if in a, a relatively short time we could look to our staff to come up with a, a list of what some of those qualitative criteria might be um, maybe try that out with the internal working group or not and maybe a, a kind of proposal for a path like the sort of incremental path that we we just started tossing around at our last working group meeting um, where we say here's our criteria and we're going to offer um, two host agreements over the next six months or 12 months and then after that there'll be two more available so we can front load the qualitative criteria in association with the host agreement um, that can be the gatekeeper but we have to be able to put out what it is we're um, measuring on in order to dispense those. Um, and then if, if we stagger that, we could get up to the eight. And even when we get to eight, they may not all stick around. So there may be something that opens up. Um, and then we always thought we would reevaluate re in a year or two or three whether eight was the right number. Um, 
I'm also concerned if we don't figure this out and have a sort of rational approach and a reasonable approach, we will be less likely to attract the businesses that I think we really want or the testing and research labs, um, I think by establishing our community as a welcoming community to this industry, working with people and keeping as up to date as we have, we're positioning ourselves to get some of the pieces that I think might be um, really good fit for our community. Um, so that's, that's why I wanna make sure we are continuing to be rational and fair in our approach. But you know, I don't wanna say, well in two weeks we're gonna have worked out some qualitative criteria and bring, bring it back. You know, we, you know, one that was thrown out tonight was you know, local hiring. That can, that can be one, there's some financial um, things. It could be, as Mr. George pointed out, you know, a really robust educational approach to young people um, that goes beyond the letter of the regulations. So those, those are just examples. There may be other things. Uh, it could be the quality of the space and how the space is out of it. I know I'm concerned that if it's gonna be co-located that the, um, just speaking for myself, that the medical side of, of the house really um, take that seriously and give people privacy and separate space and uh, not just be, well, we're doing medical because we said we would, but we're really recreational. Um, that some real thoughtfulness be given to the medical part of the co-located space. Um, so those are, those are some, and we could probably think of others, and probably Mr. Kravis has thought of some, and Mr. Bachman, but if we could start looking at the qualitative criteria and link that with the issuance of the host, the community agreements, the, the host community agreements, I think we could have that kind of gatekeeping fun function up, up front. So the other thing, the question I have is, are there any specific limitations on things that can be in the host community agreement? Do we know? You know, are there, um, are there bounds that the state has set around these in general, not specifically? To there are. Um, that has not system. stopped communities <clears throat> from going beyond those limits. So what, what kinds of things so, are not uh, allowed? The law totally states up. that uh, community impact payments have to be no more than 3% of gross sales and have to be reasonably related to costs incurred by um, the operation of a marijuana establishment on the municipality. Uh, agreements can't last beyond five years, they expire after five years. Um, <laughs> what you've seen in other communities is saying, here's our 3% for community impact and here's some community benefit stuff that you, that you can do what you want with it. <laughs> um, they're the saying it's not an impact payment, so we think it's okay to do this. And um, industry has signed those. Um, whether or not that's enforceable, whether or not a court would uphold those payments, um, whether or not that's something we even want to ask for, whether it's going to make it harder to do business in Amherst, whether or not it's going to... Um, you know, keep the businesses sustainable in the long term if they're making these additional payments or they'll choose to go elsewhere. Um, those are all policy questions, but that, so the law says 3% and five years. That's specific to, to marijuana, but is there other, are there other constraints around these type of agreements in general? So you could have a host community agreement with any number of people for any number of things, generally, you know, I presume there's one in Springfield relative to the uh, MGM coming in. I mean, that's a different, that's yeah, very, like very prescriptive. But I'm, I'm just saying, you know, there, there are potentially, you could sign a host community agreement on any topic that you wanted to encourage or discourage potentially. Are there, you know, generally, you generally don't, but, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I'm just sort of curious, mostly just to see sort of, you know, obviously it's those It's usually specifics. around, um, hiring practices, use of local contractors to do work, um, the ones that I've seen. You know, it, it, if it's taking away um, public space, maybe including a public park at, on part of the property or something like that, if it's, um, those those are the types of elements I've seen to development agreements. Allowable, there's no, but you're not aware of any things that aren't allowable as far as constraints other than what's articulated currently in the I mean, there's no case law. 
right? Yeah. Well, that's the so case. you can you can speculate anything. Yeah. Right. I just didn't know if there was you know for other not, kinds not of housekeeping the, agreements if there was you know sort of. But these are forbidden. specific. These are specific right. to marijuana use. Right. They're very specific. Right. Right. Well, I, re I really appreciate you asking that question, though, in that way, Mr. Slaughter, because that is, in fact, one of the things we've been talking about all along, is what can, aside from what the state says, what can we do? It says the 3% gross sales. It says the five years. But what if we did this? Or what if we did that? And we don't know. what. And, and, and to some extent, we also don't know what might be that thing we could ask for. And so that's one of the ways we've been depending on our relationship with the university and Mr. Kravitz's relationship with other organizations throughout the country who have been you know, dealing with legalization already to say, well, what kinds of things did you guys ask for? And maybe we'll see if that would be a thing that we could ask for here. But one of the things that makes that difficult is like so many other things, nothing is set up exactly the same way as it is in Massachusetts. So there's county-based regulation in Colorado, for example, and so it's not down to a local licensing authority in the same way. And so there's more of an argument between what the county and the state are doing, and it's just a lot different. And so it's a little hard to say, take this piece off this column and stick this one in our agreement because it is we're just pushing boundaries we're not quite clear on what we can push and so some of the host community agreements for medical were signed long ago and then as things developed and again none of those were discussed with the select board before they were signed because I think they were just considered here's the form letter you sign but they are different from each other and those are online for people who want to look at those so it's not obvious and it's not obvious I know that some years ago we didn't, but some other communities did do more of an RFI, RFP sort of approach and said, we want some of these things, what, what, these medical things. Tell us what you're going to do for us. And, of course, that's always a little trickier when you don't own the property they're going to put it in. <laughs> Whereas if we had an old mill building we wanted them to put it in, then we could say, tell us your best job for that. But right. we don't have that, so I'm not sure how we can how how we take these criteria that we develop and then overlay it on the host community agreement in a way that is basically just an agreement between this select board as part of the executive branch and this select board as the licensing authority for alcohol and parking and that sort of thing that then somehow follows through you know onto the next form of government that's going to be a little different in terms of one thing that I think is really important to keep in mind that we were reminded of at our internal working group is aside from any feelings we may have about individual medical sites becoming either entirely focused on recreational or providing both and co-located is that there is no reason to assume that they will get all the way through the local permitting process associated with their special permit to have recreational when some of them are constrained in terms, for example, just one example, of parking. And so medical appointments is a lot different than just dropping in whenever. And so there could be different traffic concerns that would be examined by the ZBA. So that might be a kind of question we want to figure out a way to get to Mr. Bachman to ask Mr. Moore before he comes before a future meeting that has more detail on that, although obviously Ms. Kruger could explain that, a lot of that to us. Um, I'm glad that we've been talking about whether or not to schedule the herbology thing because we've talked about it before, obviously, and that's why we very specifically, it isn't that, oh, it's, is it listed or not? No, we made a conscious choice not to list that on tonight's agenda. What we made a conscious choice to put on tonight's agenda was our, let's talk about whether or not we're going to do a, additional letters of support or non-opposition in general. Because if the board's feeling was in general, nope, done with that, then there was no point in scheduling it. But it is indeed on our parking lot of, of items to be scheduled depending on how tonight's discussion turned out. So indeed, the intention was if tonight's discussion was, yes, we do want to talk more about a specific one, um, we would schedule that but also if we want to talk more about how we're going to make that decision, because that was the other awkward piece that we were trying to avoid when we were talking about it in agenda setting, is that we didn't want to just have an agenda that said herbology is coming forward to talk to us for a letter of support or non-opposition. Oh, by the way, what's our criteria for that? 
for the first time to have that conversation with them there. I mean, obviously they can watch it because it's a public meeting, but it seemed to be putting undue pressure on them. So I don't know if people are going to want to talk about that more tonight. In terms of the five-year, on a completely separate note, in terms of the five-year agreement, that doesn't mean we have to sign a five-year agreement, although one of the, again, one of the ideas that came up in our internal working group is just as when you hire a town manager, for example, they tend to prefer to want to hire three- or five-year contracts rather than one-year contracts, and so that could play into an organization like this as well. On the other hand, if you have a shorter contract period, then it can be made much more clear that, hey, the environment may have changed by the time a year has passed. And so therefore, it's easier to talk about those changes. Although I believe Mr. Kravitz had already indicated that there was a way to put in the host community agreement that if a licensing local licensing process is developed at some point, that could, in theory, be included in the host community agreement. Someday we may have one, and if we do, you'll be required to comply with it. Right. whether or not the host community agreement has expired. Whether or not that'll scare any potential partners is another question, but that theoretically, when we're talking about kinds of components you can put in there, I think we thought that we could probably put that in there, but I don't know. So that's that was one thought at one point, was that, well, maybe we only sign a host community agreement for a shorter period of time as we figure more of this out. And then we'll be able to tell them because, again, that goes back to the predictability issue, right? You sign a five-year agreement, and then we develop a licensing process that you didn't really feel like you knew about that suddenly starts being in effect eight months into the agreement. That didn't feel like the kind of way we like to do things. But I do want to make sure that if we were going to talk more about how to talk about, which I know I'd like to joke about, we like to talk about how to talk about things, but the letter of support or non-opposition, because I don't know that anything we've said tonight yet, given all the things we've talked about, has gotten me any closer to having any idea of how I would come to a decision at a future meeting, what under what criteria I would be looking at another letter of support or non-opposition at that time, just like we're talking about other kinds of criteria like you know, local preference hiring and numbers of jobs and dollars. Those seem like all great things we could talk about associated with potentially the host community agreement because that seems like the only it wouldn't fit in board of health it wouldn't fit in special permit conditions but i don't have any idea what our criteria is supposed to be for deciding whether or not to do another letter of support or non-opposition yeah there's, I, I guess there's still in, in where i'm middle um behind you to, Two of my colleagues here is you who have been working on the issue through the internal working group are more familiar with the regulations and the statute probably than I am at this point as to what either the statute or the regulations provide about local communities um, legal authority to do their own licensing. There is one sentence that says that they are not preventing us from doing local licensing. It doesn't say who will do it. No guidance. That's all there is. Okay, so we do have the authority to do local licensing. We, we and be having I this assume conversation we have the, if we didn't. I assume that we have our getting guidance either from our regional planning uh, <laughs> or no. our council. That's, I'm sorry, Mr. Slaughter, I should have waited. Okay, we wouldn't be having this conversation if we weren't legally authorized to do it. We wouldn't be talking about doing it in theory if we were just trying to push the envelope. We got them, I'm sure it was our influence, that encouraged the CCC to include that one sentence, which I'll find and quote to you, about okay. local licensing. That doesn't mean, as we have said already, we have to do it. And it's also, we were as Ms. Kruger said, what feels like hours ago, we wouldn't, it's probably, we wouldn't want to do it at the last minute either. We wouldn't want it to be something like you've jumped through 85 hoops and oh, by the way, not this one. Um, it would be earlier in the process. But we do have the authority to do it. We don't know what it includes. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission doesn't know either. Unless KP Law doesn't know either. So we are, that's why we're talking to different people and trying to figure this out. Nobody has a a plan, a template for us on how to do this. Unfortunately, I think we're writing the template that then other people will use. Well, while we were sitting here, the 
I got a tweet from the Cannabis Control Commission said, need assistance with licensing process at the local level? <laughs> then be sure to check out our municipal guidance document and other great resources on our website. On, on <laughs> media right it doesn't now. say much. It doesn't be say much. Because in fact, that, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It doesn't say much because in fact, all along the thing that we've been struggling with is that they wanna talk about zoning as being local licensing. And so I finally had to pin down a couple of the commissioners and say, you're not just meaning zoning because most of that municipal guidance is about zoning. And they're like, oh, you have the ability to zone for it. Well, yeah, we have the ability to zone for houses too. But I mean, you know, great, okay, that's something. But we do have that one sentence that allows us that to do this undefined local licensing in addition to that. Right. So we're left with, um, I, I um, did look at the charter um, during the course of the conversation in 6.3, which is the section on the Board of License Commissioners, does specifically provide that the board shall have all powers with respect to other licenses for which the town has statutory and regulatory authority unless otherwise assigned to another town office or, or officer by general law. Yes. So um, yeah. I think that uh, we are recognizing that this will become a function of the license commission um, at a future date. Um, and of course, the other thing that we have been talking about is the transition provisions. And, uh, you know, I think that we, I am in agreement with the general discussion that has been essentially taking place, which directs that um, there shouldn't be any um, action taken. Um, See if we can say, um, unless, well, I'm not going to go back into it, but um, unless there's substantial reason to go forward, essentially. And uh, I think that without going back into the language right now, because I'm not going to look through the charter to find that specific phrase, but I, we are in a position where um, I think the um, interests of the town in promoting responsible marijuana, retail marijuana mandates that we um, develop essentially a licensing process and criteria now uh, that this, under the transition provision, it cannot wait until there's a uh, council seated uh, because too much time will have elapsed um, but, um, before they can, organize themselves to have the, the kind of discussion that has to take place. Ms. Krugan. I don't disagree with you, Mr. Stumbert. The only, the only place I'm kind of stuck is um, when we talk about criteria, I don't understand why we can't have the criteria be applied to whether or not we would issue a host community agreement. I know it's the manager's job, but if we say these are the six things that we're gonna evaluate you on, that becomes qualitative criteria, and the manager said, I'm only gonna do two more host agreements this year, and they have to score well, and I, I don't mean scoring necessarily numerically, but evaluate highly on these criteria, or you're not gonna get one of the two available um, host community agreements. So I don't know that it has to, again, I'm not opposed to licensing, but I think it plays a different role than that selection criteria up front. So we, put out a clear message, this is what we're looking for, this is how many are available, and then it's like an RFP process, but not literally that. Does the board think that medical, existing medical sites should be given precedence over new sites? No. I mean, I, I, you know, in, in some ways they, they have that already by virtue of the way the law, yes. law currently mm -hmm. is playing out. Exactly. Do they need any further incentive? Right. That's where it gets a little trickier, I think. In other words, hmm. <clears throat> do we, you know, if we hold off on any other licensing except that allowed by, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a 
significantly unfair advantage in some respects, maybe, but. So, so I guess I should clarify my question. Um, <laughs> right now, the, the uh, gatekeeper is the host community agreement. In order to move forward for recreational, an operator needs the host community agreement. It's the only thing they need from the town. Um, so there's lots of different ways to decide how to award those. You say, yeah, at least Mr. Kravitz says yes to everybody. You say no to everybody. You can say we value this because there's a, you know we've, we've our existing pre-approved um, medical facilities. Um, we value um, a, a site that's going to generate a lot of economic uh, growth. There's lots of different ways to look at it. So I think that that's sort of the things I struggle with in terms of whether to sign a host community agreement. Well, first off, should we sign one or not? But also, um, what are the values that you want to bring to that kind of um, decision? And especially if we're going to, we know we can only do eight uh, that's under our zoning, but how do we want to help this industry roll out in the town of Amherst is, is the real thing I struggle with. Well, since you asked the question, um, I would agree with Ms. Brewer, not necessarily. Um, we may ask um, in, in the list of qualitative criteria, it might be experience um, as an operator here or elsewhere, and then that could play into it. Um, there could be locational preferences, but I wouldn't automatically say just because you have a host agreement for medical that that gives you a leg up for recreational. Unless it's, but, I, but, I, but having criteria that might kind of get you to the same place, like operating experience or uh, enforcing security systems or whatever, whatever it was that was of value, but I wouldn't automatically make that m my own preferred criteria. Right. I, I would suggest that it's, it's very likely that the host community agreement for Recreational is going to have a much, or, or adult use, is going to have, um, and will continue to have a different set of criteria. It'll be, I think the the medical will be a baseline, and then the the mm -hmm. the other will be, and then on top of that will be an additional set of, of criteria or constraints that we're we're seeking from from uh, potential um, r adult use uh, retailer. Um, and I think the thing I'm struggling with most, and I, in in some ways, is what are the things that would be inappropriate for a host community agreement that would be appropriate for a licensing authority, whether it be us or the subsequent licensing. You know, sort of what are the questions that that fall into that category that you want answers to, that aren't necessarily want to put in a binding contract, um, that aren't necessarily. Um, potentially, uh, you know, executable in a contract, I think, is, is what I think about is that are there things, are there questions we want to pose, are there answers we want that are not ones that can be bound to a contract, or not wise to be bound into a contract, which is essentially what a host community agreement is. Um, I, I think about, like, the, the idea of putting in, oh, if we come up with a licensing thing, we do it later, I think that's, that's a difficult circumstance to put a business in because you know, it's kind of signing a bit of a blank check uh, relative to the, that they're going to sort of set up and have all these expenses relative to getting started, and then you're going to apply this licensing criteria that comes in after they're in place that may be very difficult or untenable for them from a business point of view. Um, and and so I think that's that's not a I, – I, I struggle with the fairness of that as well, so I think trying to have some of that in advance is, is – the more we can have it in advance, the better off we are in that regard. But Mr. Steinberg. Yeah, I mean, I have three that come to mind, two that came up during the course of the presentations or prior discussion that we've had. One is, is that uh, there'd be criteria that's required on um, public health um, instruction that in information that is provided to um, purchasers of recreational marijuana so that um, that public health interest is being served. Um, a second one that uh, was raised in prior discussion was that if there's a co-location, um, criteria for um, the co-location to keep the 
two entities going strongly but separately so that um, the needs of each individual population seeking assistance um, are both met and not impinged by the other. And um, the third is really implicit in all of our licensing that we've been doing with alcohols, and so we might as well look back on our experiences, is to make sure that um, if there is a violation of um, a provision either locally derived or statewide derived, like the age limit, being the most obvious, um, that we have as um, a clear authority left to our licensing authority um, or um, to suspend the license if um, there's a failure to adhere to that provision, even if it's a provision that's by state law and not by our own doing. Or? So, <laughs> I feel like we're back at the beginning of the circle because one of the things we're still having trouble teasing out is the difference between what these terms mean, not those criteria, which are very clear, but what these terms mean in terms of what we're calling licensing and what we're calling criteria for a host community agreement and what we're calling contents of a host community agreement. So I would argue that some of the things that have been discussed <coughs> are things that Mr. Bachman has indicated he would, con with guidance from us, would entertain as being, this is why I would sign this host community agreement versus a different host community agreement. Not that those things would necessarily be in the host community agreement. For example, I don't have any idea how we would calculate potential economic impact, but what, unless it was more specific around jobs or particular lot that was going to generate particular taxes. But I don't need to figure that out right now. But that is the kind of thing that arguably could be something that would be more of a checklist that the town manager would be looking at, would obviously have been communicated to the economic development director, and would be, do you meet you know, three or five of these things that I'm going to be more likely to want to pursue a host community agreement with you? That's not a local licensing process. And so a local licensing process in particular sounds like it goes with the violations issue and I know Board of Health has expressed some interest in having inspections, although whether or not they have the bandwidth and resources to do additional inspections is always the question, of course. But they have, it has been made clear in the law that you can have additional local Board of Health inspections associated with certain things, the, the food complication being slightly aside. So in an inspe if we send an enforcement, you know, similar to when we had problems with a, a liquor licensee, which we don't see very often for some reason, that ABCC do sometimes hands down liquor license violations, but we have done very few here locally. And so if we did something like that, like revoked, a, if we had a license, we could revoke it. If we don't have a license, we can't revoke it. And so does that become something that's housed within the Board of Health, or is that something that's in the licensing authority like us or the future licensing commission? And then are those things like you know, economic development, minority owned, things, things that we would give credit to, local residents being preferentially hired, um, would those be criteria as to whether or not to consider and, and how would the town manager apply those, I think, versus you would uh, an applicant would come and tell the local licensing authority they were planning to do those things. I, I'm, we're just not sure what that mechanism would look like and which of those things is which, which column it fits under. So I think at this point, um, I'm thinking about sort of what we, what we should think about re regarding next steps, and I think that obviously we're not nor do we intend to have some definitive sort of vote on something this evening, I don't think. But I think, as, and, and I, I do want to come back to the topic of letters of support and opposition and, and to that topic it's by <laughs> itself. But I think with regard to the, the, uh, the concept of local licensing, I mean, I think what I'm hearing as far as just a, you know, 
that there's some um, since we should move in that direction and and try to articulate that pretty well and and I think how it interplays with uh, you know sort of violation enforcement and host community agreement components I mean those are all sort of intertwined in some ways and we'll probably have to start to draw the lines between those but I'm thinking about what as a board what we want to think about from a, from a next step step standpoint um, so Mr. Bachman? so I I think I have three takeaways one is um, herbology schedule <laughs> um, licensing start to pursue what that looks like and host community agreements come up with criteria that you can look at so I think that you know those are certainly certainly there um, what I would also suggest is that as as each of us and certainly if the public wants to offer a suggestion to us they're welcome at any time but I think when we as board members are thinking about the distinguishing pieces between you know what are things for licensing versus what are the things that we want you to include in a host community agreement you know um, and start thinking about those concrete things we've had a few mentioned tonight but I'm sure there's others that we'll want to think about a little bit and start to compile our lists um, and if they want to send those to the manager or to Mr. Kravitz or um, you know uh, we should start to do that now because you know to to try to think more deeply about that and over a little bit of time I think is better than just trying to come up with them on the fly Mr. Steinberg here. Yeah. I do think that um, it's very important that we structure our thinking about who is going to monitor enforcement of the license of state law and um, who's going to take action as a result. And I um, now I'm reflecting on what I've heard about problems with um, alcohol enforcement in the Commonwealth that ABCC carries on a large part of the charge but is not really adequately funded and adequately staffed to really do the kind of job that we probably would ideally like to see them do. And um, then it falls on local police to sort of backstop where ABCC just has reached the limit of its ability. So we want to make sure that there's a process since we don't know if there's going to be um, significant enforcement by CCC, the Cannabis Control Commission at this point. So we do need to be prepared to make sure that if there is not, that our local police have the um, ability to monitor and that we have a mechanism to deal with violations. Thank you. Mr. Kravitz. No, please. I just wanted to add, um, you know, it, it's the end of June now, and I know that uh, revenue is not the primary concern. It's, you know, a, a responsible and, and safe rollout. But I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that, that the price of marijuana in Colorado over the first two years declined significantly. All the counties that um, ban marijuana sales switched around and did not make nearly as much money as those that had originally allowed it. And I'm just thinking about the timeline and is this, could this potentially become a political issue in the races as we get closer to the elections? Um, I, I don't know what else is on the select board agenda, but I'm just saying I, I could see it I could also see the the um, council when they take over are probably going to be spend the first few months getting settled in and then immediately going into the budget. So this isn't going to you know I don't know how high on their uh, agenda moving along a licensing authority or or ensuring that licensing happens. So uh, um, you know I I don't know I'm just. I, I don't know that we've given, and I'm, again, that, that's not necessarily the point, but I don't know that, that we've given um, the, the business interests in the room any sort of clarity coming out of this discussion that at some point soon they're probably going to have to make a business decision of whether or not they want to continue to pursue something in Amherst, and unless we have a clear path forward, um, 
relatively shortly, I don't know how that's going to work. So, well, I would suggest, and I'm going to express my opinion. I'll offer, you know, an opportunity to the others in, uh, on the board. But I think that um, I certainly, you know, understand and respect the the urgency, and I'm less concerned about town revenue. I mean, I'm not, but I mean, it's not the primary focus. Right. But but I think at the same time, we understand. I certainly understand the 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 more we delay and uh, the difficulty it puts businesses in to make good business decisions. And there gets to be a point where they just have to move on and make their own decisions relative to that. But, but I, my own thinking was that, you know, as we said early in the conversation is the need for this to happen relatively soon is pretty important because I think a, we overly advantage medical facilities that have a quicker path through the CCC. If we don't have it in place in some reasonable way, um, but I also think just, you know, as a as as Ms. Kruger said, being a welcoming community to the to the idea of, of doing this and trying to do it well. So I think from my point of view, I mean I think we're we're still a little early because we're still trying to get our heads around exactly how we want to sort of shape this a little bit, but I think we're gonna try to do that to my mind, I certainly want to do that fairly quickly. Um, you know, because I think for a variety of reasons, you know, our own self interest but also in, in the interest of of that, you know, business community and wanting them having clear rules to operate within, because that's critical for them. So, Ms. Kruger. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, in my mind, I think uh, Mr. Bachman's three points as takeaways make sense, but I don't, I don't think we said definitively we're not going to go any further till we have all the licensing all figured out. That's kind of an add-on, and we can address it in those agreement you shall participate if we have that but I don't think we were saying we're gonna wait till we get that piece all figured out before we're gonna go ahead and use a criteria based um, release of some host agreements and I'm a little surprised because Mr. Kravitz's memo um, 4b it says delaying additional retail marijuana establishments until such a time as the town develops and implements a local licensing process is a prudent course of action because of the significant interest Amherst has received by potential recreational marijuana retail operators. I, it seems a little contradictory to what you just said. I don't disagree with what you just said about if we make it too, take too long or too arduous, that could have some um, detrimental impacts. But here you argue that because we don't have the licensing, we shouldn't act. But doesn't that memo say that we would allow the medical to be uh, co-locate with recreational, so we would have the revenue from recreational establishments? What I'm what I'm worried about is we're saying we're not doing anything until we have license. Okay, but okay. So if we say we're not and then we're not prefer we're not preference we're not at least what I hear from this group we're right. not we're not going with part A and your part B says therefore wait till you get the licensing before you do any more in addition to the f potential four. But that not so if we take that first part out. Then not, I would then say don't take the second part. <laughs> OK. I want it to be clear because I, it was I, a that premise. was the part that troubled me. Like, don't do anything else to get your licensing, but just do the four. And we're saying, well, maybe not yes. just the four, so therefore not that either. OK. So that, that was my understanding, too, beyond the fact that it was what I wanted. I think it was also what we agreed, is that we are not following one on this memo, which is that we are not giving preference to the medical. And that's, Thank you for that's as of this moment, no longer a criteria at this time, as opposed to what it says here, which is what Mr. Bachman said he's following for right now. We are not giving them preference. In terms of, again, I'm, I, I'm belaboring this because I'm not sure we're getting the difference, is that talking about criteria that are in the host community agreement, as in you will do a thing, you will provide, maybe it's uh, a way of dealing with the educational materials, for example. You put that in the host community agreement. Versus economic impact some amazing rubric is developed, that's not gonna be in the host community agreement more than likely. That's gonna be more of a, a criteria of whether or not the town manager is willing to sign a host community agreement. And that can all be done separately while we're continuing to talk about 
the enforcement piece, the part about the licensing. So we don't have to hold anything up for the licensing per se as long as we feel like, for, for example, we don't have to hold anything up for our licensing process if what we're saying can happen in the meantime is one, we are not giving medical preference, two, we are gonna develop very quickly some criteria as to what host community agreement we would enter, we would have town manager entertain signing based on the kinds of values we've expressed tonight as being important values, some of which may not end up being delineated within the agreement, but that was the idea behind why those have a preference. And so I think we can talk about the enforcement piece like not like a really long time from now, but at a future time, because one of the other things that came up in talks with the CCC informally is that in terms of interpreting their sentences about municipal requirements and local rules, regulations, ordinances, and bylaws. I said, you do understand that we do things with liquor licensing, for example, that are regulations, not bylaws. They're not zoning bylaws, they're not general bylaws, they're regulations. And they said, yeah, sure, that's fine. You, you can do that. So the council could pass ordinances that say things that the licensing authority will do. But in the absence of them having signed any ordinances, the having passed any ordinances, the local licensing authority could go ahead and make up regulations just like we've been attempting to make up regulations associated with alcohol. So I mean, it's not like the council, they have to wait for the council. They can work independently on this. It would just, and so that's one of the reasons it would be nice to give them something to start with as well. But again, I still think the licensing part of it can be worked on at the same time, we're trying to move forward with giving people clearer ideas. So I, I agree with that, I think, but I think the licensing uh, endeavor is a pretty significant undertaking. It's not gonna happen overnight, it's not gonna happen in a few months, it's gonna take a long time to develop all the criteria and the systems, because no one has invented this yet. We can say we wanna license it like tobacco or for alcohol, but no one has invented a, li a local license for marijuana yet. And if we're going to devote an enormous amount of time to doing that, it's going to be a pretty, I mean, you know what it's taken already just to even talk about host community agreements, which are sort of, there's a whole bunch out there already. There's hundreds. So um, I think there is some market sensitivity that, that I'm sensitive to. Um, I think that there's a, a rational approach to, to saying, and I, and I appreciate the feedback that because you have a medical facility doesn't give you a leg up or an automatic um, uh, buy in to a, his community agreement, but it, 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 my inclination is that we would want to issue a couple of host community agreements sooner than later and then phase, phase them in over time. I think that's a rational approach. I think that's um, where we need to be as a community and we need to you know, talk about public safety and public health about what, what needs to be, what would those things look like, but to you know, a lot of communities are stalling, you know, or, or, or put a moratorium on, on, on this. And I think there is going to be a, that, that actually buys us some time, I think, in the, in the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But um, I think where we are as a community is that we are looking to implement this in a rational, um, not, not rush to, to, to implement them, but to get it moving and get some, some, um, licenses out there so I think we'll um, we'll leave that there for now but I do think there's a, a bit of a conversation we need to have about the letters of support and non-opposition and, and sort of um, the point Ms. Brewer raised earlier about sort of our criteria around those um, and what we're thinking about uh, relative to those and I think our other conversation plays into that but I do think it's important for us to if we can uh, articulate sort of how we view those now um, versus how we viewed them two years ago or whenever it was. We did the last one. It's been forever. We're a lot younger. <laughs> yeah, we're all a lot younger. That was earlier this evening. But um, but I but anyway. So I, I do want to have a little bit of a conversation about that. I don't know that it has to be a, a long conversation per se, but I do think we should. Um, frame that a little bit because I think you know what I've heard tonight is that from an agenda standpoint we, we should uh, take up the topic relative to the folks from urology and I think that's fair to them as well but I also want to give them a frame with which we're trying to view that conversation 
uh, partly for our own sake, um, but also in an opportunity to give them a chance to repair appropriately. Um, so if, if anyone wants to offer some suggestion about how they see the these letters of uh, support or non-opposition at this point, given the changes that have occurred. Anyone? <laughs> That's what Go happens ahead. when we tire us out. Um, right. So one of the things that helps me actually is something we already agreed to, which is the idea that we would not automatically give the leg up on getting a host community agreement locally. So we understand that the state has established its own process about saying if you have medical, you jump to the head of the line for getting your recreational application approved. I don't agree with what the state did, but that doesn't matter because that's what the state did. But since we locally have just established, I believe, that we are not giving that additional leg up at the local level as well, I feel less conflicted about medical at this point in the process. Because again, for the thousandth time, we wanted medical to open three years ago. We finally have one. We thought we were going to potentially have up to four, although I don't think we all really thought it was all going to actually work out for all those places because they were building and buying, et cetera. Um, so we wanted medical. Town wanted medical years ago. We've only got one, and that's great. I don't know at this point that we need to make another medical letter happen in order for recreational to happen because those two are not necessarily connected and we're not necessarily giving priority and we aren't giving priority locally to people who already have it. On the other hand, people have, you know, invested in a process and so I don't know how we decide at this point. Earlier on it was easier because we could just say, sure, we all know what we're doing, go ahead and figure it out. You seem to have met all the criteria. We don't have any reason to say no. We figure the market will sort you out. Please, somebody start selling medical. Um, that's why I'm frustrated now because I don't, I appreciate you saying what you did about the frame because I, I don't want to put another applicant through the process of saying, well, we don't know what we want. And so how do we decide? I think for me around the medical, I mean, I think, I think back to what we, we looked at before and that was, you know, certainly there were certain things that, that were presented in varying forms from, the, from the different applicants, but you know, how they're, you know, uh, so I think I'll, I, I would, I would be judging sport non-opposition based on the same kind of frame that I would take to it, uh, as in the past, which was independent of the, the adult use. And so, you know, what is their, uh, security protocols? Are they having, you know, what's their, uh, medical staff like on, you know, on site? What's their, um, uh, you know, process for, um, you know, uh, transport and security materials, uh, advising clients on use and, and support around that, um, those kind of things, because I think, you know, if we're going to, if the host community agreement for recreational is entirely separate process, and I think we'll have different criteria for that, um, then, then I think I, I sort of fall back on what was what was I thinking about with regard to the, the medical at the time? And so I'm going to think in those same terms. It's like, well, are they being a good medical provider? Um, as if it were any other medical facility, if we had this level of control over pharmacies, what are, you know, what's our expectation around that? Um, you know, and, and I think given that, you know, again, I think we're still in the same place we were before, which is in some respects, given that one is all that's opened of the, of the, of the four we've dealt with, I think that you know, the market will do what the market does as far as sorting out, did we oversubscribe on medical? I don't, you know, that hasn't been the case so far. We've got one. I doubt that that's the entirety of the medical market in our town. So I think that will, will sort itself. Um, so I don't think it, especially relative to medical, I don't think it is a, is a circumstance where um, we'll be a wash in it. <laughs> in a way that we'd be concerned that it's being abused in some way. I don't see that happening. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm gonna use the same kind of criteria 
and thought process I used before, which is, you know, are they a good medical facility? Are they going to, you know, are they taking that part of it seriously? Are they treating their patients well? Are they trying to care for people that are struggling with, with, you know, medical conditions that are chronic or extraordinarily uh, painful or both, you know, uh, in a way that's sensitive and, and uh, matches the values that I think people wanted when, when they were, um, you know, supportive of medical marijuana to begin with. So I'm, I'm going to kind of use the same frame personally, I think, but I, I'm curious as what other people think around that, this topic. I want to push back on that after they talk. Well, being the one who voted, who, who didn't vote yes <laughs> on the Happy Valley application, uh, you know, I sort of have to get reflect back as to why I didn't vote yes on that application after having voted yes on three others. And uh, I think that some of the criteria that I was concerned about was that um, Zoning says what it says, but that didn't require us to issue letters of support just because zoning allowed it. And um, it seemed that the proximity to two other establishments um, that were potentially, and I thought more than potentially, I thought likely to be there because I thought that there was a real interest in, you know, these, they have gone ahead and um, continued on the process including um, ZPA special permits. So it's gone all the way through. So I did think about that aspect of it. I thought about the fact that um, there's a proposal to build mixed use housing directly across the street and the question of how that factored in and how that was playing against the zoning rule and sort of this question of, you know, once you've given the letter, um, can you then pull it back? Is it sort of the first first use out of the gate? And that, that whole set of questions. Um, I was a little bit uncomfortable, the fact that um, we didn't know what um, was going to happen with uh, legalization of recreational marijuana and what kinds of additional rights would be given to the establishments. I mean, we have a little bit, I say little bit of clarification on that issue. Um, so I agree that I would look at the same kinds of questions that I looked at before. I think that there's others that I'm not sure that I think about, but I'm not sure that they're appropriate or not. I'd have to almost get um, some legal counsel to know on some things, whether we could, whether they can be officially criteria that we could consider as we make the decision. Ms. Kruger, did you have? I think I want to take each application, you know, separately on its own merits. Although I, I will admit, as we heard the first couple, I'm not sure we really knew what we were looking at. Um, there was a lot of presentation and not a lot of our ability to decipher the, the depth or sincerity. Um, so we get, you know, a very nice presentation or a pause present presentation, I think. I like the idea of having other criteria when it comes to issuing the host community agreement. Um, so I think it gives us that. But I'm interested in hearing more um, applicants and see if they are persuasive. So my pushback is what does persuasive mean? So I totally understand a specific criteria like because, because we did have this very special situation where the zoning allowed for it, we'd planned for that, et cetera, that was great. But we really had carte blanche, as far as we knew, to decide on yes, a letter of support or an opposition or not. And unlike, for example, if we decide not to give out a liquor license, we have to have some s certain types of justifications, other types of justifications, ABCC, that the community might think are very justified, ABCC has said are not. 
there wasn't case law, there wasn't regulation around, there weren't opinion letters that had been provided by someone that said, oh, you can't judge it on this, you can judge it on that. So it's still just a made up thing at this point is what True. it comes down to. True. And the reason I was, I got the part about being concerned about uh, proximity, you know, because even though the zoning bylaw says X about proximity, that can also be a value of the community as well. Again, because ABC, we don't have a group like ABCC is telling us, you can't just say that liquor store will compete with that liquor store, therefore you don't want it, or you don't want too many liquor stores close together. You, you can't just say no for that reason. We could say no for that reason, for uh, medical letters of support or non-opposition. I'm not saying we should. I'm not saying that's the list we should go down, but we do have more. But the fact that we have more flexibility means we also don't necessarily have criteria. And so... At one point during one of those conversations, we, presentations, conversations amongst ourselves, there was some discussion about whether or not somebody was actually the kind of nonprofit they were presenting themselves as. And I got very frustrated with that because I didn't really think that was ours to decide. But again, um, whether or not they are sincere in their desire to help medical patients, I, how do I quantify that? I mean, they're going to, they have met a ton of requirements working through the state as nonprofit, as having certain types of medical personnel available to do certain types of things. Will they go above and beyond? Will they say they'll go above and beyond? I just, I've still got nothing to work with other than gut. I've, all I'm hearing is gut. And if that's all we've got, then I guess that's all we've got. But I'm not going to try and rejudge the same things the state judges because they've already been through that. And the state's done a lot more of those than we have in terms of ferreting out whether or not somebody's really a nonprofit or whether or not somebody really understands the security requirements. We don't have additional security requirements unless we establish them. So I'm still lost. I would agree, but I think we've also heard, you know, there's, there, we've gotten, just to the security question, I think we've gotten different explanations of how they choose to approach that. Um, so there's a level of specificity that we've gotten from some of the organizations relative to how they're going to, to do that, and that provides, again, a comfort or discomfort level with us, which, again, influences our opinion about whether to give or not give a, a letter of support or non-opposition. So I, I think you're right. I think it is a dissatisfying process in a lot of ways because we don't have a sort of, you know, measurables per se uh, that we've articulated. I'm not sure we can. Um, there are a number of measurables, obviously, the state has gone through with regard to its requirement and process. And, and in some ways, that should provide us a certain level of comfort, but, but maybe not, depending on our faith in the state system. <laughs> um, but... You know, it's, it's um, you know, there are, you know, it's kind of like when we're enforcing, um, you know, w we've had hearings about enforcement of, of, you know, violations of liquor laws, you know, well, what's the right penalty? You know, we've, we've had to do that kind of freelance as well. I think we're, we're still operating within that. There's not a, a long history of sort of this is kind of what people have done or not done or these are the kinds of things that, you know, our, our um, you know, the sort of metrics that people have used in, in regard to that. So I think we, we will, in some ways, you know, be hanging our hat on our own judgment and, and trying to, you know, express in our meeting and with our questions the, the kinds of things we're concerned about and hopefully providing a, a, a sense of due diligence to the community that we've, you know, trying to extract, not extract from them, but you know, get some reassurance from, from, from them that, that they've uh, you know, met some, some level of, of uh, uh, effort and thought about these kind of things. You know, if, if you ask a certain question and there's no answer whatsoever, I mean, that could be a, a deal breaker. And it's like, you know, if you ask, I can't think of a question right off the top of my head, but I mean, you know, it's like, um, you know, are you going to have uh, closed circuit monitoring of, you know, the the vault of, you know, and if they said, oh, we never thought of that, that would be really problematic for me. But you know, that's 
quick example of something, but you know, it's not that it expressly required by the state, not necessarily, maybe, maybe not. So I think that there are, you know, ways in which we can get to a sense of, of comfort with or discomfort with, you know, providing a letter, even if we don't have as, as robust a process as we'd really all like, I think. Well, just, I think sometimes because this is new and we're trying to do this really thoughtfully, we may be overthinking some of this. So we don't know how many medical establishments the market can support. And as long as we have some base criteria, which essentially is, is, is provided by the state and maybe our gut feeling or, you know, show your face, tell us who you are. We want to know who you are in our community. A lot of this is going to be figured out in the permitting with the ZBA because they're going to have specific conditions, possibly the license as another enforcement tool. I, we're going to have to put a foot in the water and try some of these, and I'm expecting they're not all going to last, that there's going to be a sort of market level at some point where, no, we can't support eight medical or maybe not even four, but we don't really know. And so um, to act like we're sort of ZBA setting all these conditions might, I mean, I'm beginning, maybe because I'm tired now, I don't feel well. Um, I think we might be overthinking this. And so for me, I'm willing to let some of these go and see how they do. And I think the market's going to make some decisions about who's the best place to go to get the kind of service I want when I have a medical condition. And we can't necessarily figure that all out up front. Can I ask another question? Yes. So one of the things that you've brought up and that I know has come up in other conversations is the idea that is that is not as, as I understand state law, not as strict in the state regulations about providing the privacy for a medical patient, whereas there have been other places that have just basically put a tape line down and said, this is the aisle, this is the express lane, so to speak, this is the medical line, and this is the adult use line and like there's no treatment as though it's it's more like CVS than it is like a concierge doctor so I mean there there are differences there and so it I don't know if that's something we can encourage the ZBA at some point to include in their conditions and if that's where part of our conversation in, ends up going especially as I have a note here to remind us to send letter, questions to Mr. Bachelman for Mr. Mora it, or he can decide if they're for Mr. Moore or for Mr. Kravitz or whatever, um, ahead of our J July 9th meeting when Mr. Moore said he can be here. If that's the kind of thing that, because the select board doesn't normally say to the ZBA that we appoint, well, these are the things we think you ought to think about, um, that doesn't usually happen. Maybe this is enough of an odd situation where we do think that's appropriate, but is that maybe the kind of thing that you're talking about asking people so, like the vault thing that it's not required by law, but it gives you a sense of what their intentions are in a way that isn't just, they already jumped through all those hoops with the state. Okay. Mr. Kravitz. So I'll, I'll just raise the, the fact that you won't, I don't think have the opportunity to ask recreational marijuana establishments how they're monitoring their vaults. So is it, is it about the medical stuff? I'm just, you know, so I just bring up the point that, that this isn't the, um, there isn't an opportunity for, for recreational establishments, and I don't know how, how that plays in or not, but um, are you holding the medical ones to a higher standard, and is, should you be, or vice versa? Do we put that as part of the licensing process? But anyway, yeah. <laughs> you know, just a point we've talked about this before. We have a number of licensed pharmacies in town that have controlled substances, and we don't seem to have the same level of concern about their security. And right. because this is new, putting all these layers on, um, and I, again, um, we have a lot of other dangerous things happening, and we don't put this level of scrutiny on. And I'm not saying we shouldn't care about that, but in the special permit, they're going to have to have a security plan. It's going to have to meet certain criteria. So it's, it will be hard, except the gut feeling, to ferret out, do we want to go ahead or not? But um, it may just come down to how we vote. And you know, when our 
Um, fifth member comes back from Prague, although I'm not sure who it is. You may never come back we, from Prague. It could, it could change the whole dynamic. You might have a whole different other take. But right. um, I think if we could, I'm also feeling like we, for the first time, we, you know, we have uh, somebody who's taking notes for us, and they're going to end up with the carpal tunnel if we don't end, up, <laughs> if we don't end this discussion soon, because this is really right. um, going on for quite a while. Right. So I think, we, you know, we've kind of made the sausage here a little bit tonight, and so that's the way it goes, I think, in some respects. But I think it, for me anyway, it certainly clarified what I want to think about between now and, and our next meeting relative to what and how I would approach this, and, and that may evolve a bit over the ensuing week or two. So, in, you know, unless we have an, anything else we want to comment relative to this, I think we should let Mr. Kravitz go, and perhaps our other guests are ready to go as well. <laughs> and and unless there's some next steps that someone wants to mention relative to this specifically, I mean, we've got. So we'll send comments to Mr. Bachelman and he'll sort out who should. Right, if, certainly Mr. on the, on the early topic Mr. about you know, licenses and host community agreements and, and that sort of stuff, certainly, yeah, absolutely. I think that's the right thing to do is send to him and prepare um, those to go to either Mr. Moore or Mr. Kravitz appropriately. And because we'll think of things over the, you know, ensuing days that could help inform us for our continued conversations about this so yes so thank you very much thank you all for, thank you. Thank you all for being patient and bringing us out so next on our agenda is a topic we've been carrying which I'm, I'm still throwing around the idea. We have to come back to the bylaws review committee. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. We yes, we do. Issue. But you were saying. I was just saying, do we have anything on the charter transition? Yes, we do. Um, thank you, so, Mr. Chair. The um, legislature, the House and Senate have engrossed the bill, and that means they, they've passed it. Now it's on the governor's desk for him to sign. He has 10 days to sign. Uh, I know the governor, we've been in contact, I've been in contact with the governor's office, two people in the governor's office, and they are doing their due diligence on the bill. Um, they have ac actually made an independent inquiry to our town clerk to get some information about deadlines for, uh, for the nomination, for, um, about for the uh, candidates and things like that. So it seems that they're paying attention to it and they're on it. So I'm looking forward to hopefully, um, having the governor sign it in the relatively near future. Great. Hooray. Yeah. <laughs> just, just because it settles the question. Yes. I mean, that, that's the, you know, independent of people's thoughts about the particulars. Right. But, um, so are there any other, does anyone else have anything relative to the charter transition that we need to bring up this evening? Nope. If not, then uh, let's go back to the uh, committee board's appointments and reappointments and, and the topic Mr. Steinberg brought up earlier relative to the to the question on on the uh, bylaw review committee, um, so if you would be so kind as to restate that for yeah. us. Just so I think it's obviously, if anybody from this board or anyone else has uh, people to suggest, they should do so um, because we still are looking, but. In any event, we do have this one recommendation from a current member of the board, um, the, the committee that we did appoint, and um, that recommendation is somebody who is not a resident of the town of Amherst, but is a resident of an adjoining town. Um, but according to the pitch that was given to me, obviously somebody with strong credentials. And um, I think that the question is, do we think it appropriate to even consider the issue? And um, is there any guidance that, because um, if, if this if this select board says, no, we don't want to consider anybody who's not a resident of the town, then we shouldn't even bother to um, go any further with that right. review. Right. I have to say I'm a little uncomfortable with it, personally, because I think that, you know, it is, there are some aspects of that review committee that are really pretty straightforward sort of stuff, but there are aspects that require some, um, some interpretation and some nuance, and I think having 
someone from outside of town do that is makes me a little uncomfortable. It's not that they're not entirely capable of coming to the exact same place somebody from town would come from, but I think it it could be um, I think it could end up being problematic if if something were controversial and then you know the 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 uh, the idea of of someone's you know bias or non bias you know might come into play relative to them being not a resident. So I I see it as a little problematic. But that's that's my own opinion. I don't know if uh, the others have similar thoughts or not. I, I mean, there's some. Either or. No, I, I mean, I, I have some discomfort, but I don't know if it's r sort of rational. It's like I would rather it be somebody, but I also don't want to take too long because the committee had gotten going. They're enthusiastic, and they really need that third member. And right. um, we've tossed out names, um, you know, um, amongst ourselves and tried to recruit. And it's it's hard. It's been hard, a hard sell. Um, we're looking for a particular skill set and temperament. And, um, if it's someone who's willing to roll up their sleeves and is known to one of the committee members, you know, I, I don't want to wait too much longer. And so I would, I would accept my discomfort with that person if we're going to be weeks out without somebody. So it's not really an answer. But. Right. So having had at least four people turn me down, <laughs> two more recently, um, another that I forwarded along to Mr. Steinberg, who's since turned us down. Um, it is a very specialized sort of set of skills, and we definitely had these, we were so thrilled with our initial pick of three that seemed to meet those so well, and many of these other would have been terrific substitutes, um, but yeah, they didn't agree. So I guess without just saying, oh, do we know the person? Um, if the person has a particular set of skills that really seems really super relevant as opposed to just somebody they like to work with because they have before, mm -hmm. um, I, do. I guess I, and, and, the, and both of the two remaining members think it's a good idea, then I guess with some reluctance, I mean, like I said, I had so many people that, I mean, we thought about a lot of people, but specific people we recruited that just for whatever reason can't make the time to do it at this point and you know now is the time it needs to be done um, if i could ask mr yeah. stomach do, don't you have one pending possibility and then and if that did not pan out then this would be the next yes. possibility yes there is one person um who's a t resident of the town who um, I have talked with at the recommendation of um, somebody who works for the town, the department head, and uh, I uh, asked him to talk to the three current members of the committee or some combination, some number of them, and then get back to me. And uh, that individual is planning to do that this week. Um, then we would have a recommendation from a town senior staff person and could have recommendations from the committee. Um, and uh, we might want to set up a little bit more of an interview process, but that would be somebody who would be within the town. Otherwise, we have no one else um, at this point. And um, the person who's not from Amherst, I have not reached out to at all because I didn't even feel comfortable doing that without some guidance from this group. Mm -hmm. well, I think, I think what I'm hearing is that you know mm -hmm. keep pursuing the person that's in town, and that's preferable, I think, to everybody's. Mm -hmm. But if not, then I think we may need to widen our field of view on that. So hopefully, that's maybe somebody's listening. Who I perhaps hope so. yeah. we're hoping someone's we don't even still know listening. If the person not from Amherst is is truly interested or right we haven't had right. that's right but, but it's so, theoretically so possible. i would i would say if, if everything else falls out then right. yeah meanwhile if you think of anyone else keep thinking keep thinking been wrecking my brain i know we all have 
All right. Okay. So I think next up is um, town manager report. Do you? Mm -hmm. I do have a few things I want to mention. First is that um, people in the community may have noticed that our, some of our neighboring communities um, have imposed in, in water limits or water restrictions. Um, those are communities that are um, a, have a different measure than we do in terms of when they have to institute water restrictions as part of their permit. We do not have those restrictions on part of our permit. We have, according to the DPW, have plenty of water. We have sources that we have not even begun to tap yet. We're in pretty good condition. It was a conversation we had with the university, and we are preparing a communication to the colleges and to the universities to update them on where we are at this moment in time. And we'll be doing that through the summer because it's a highly sensitive issue for, the, for our institutional partners. Um, so we're in pretty good shape. Um, we'll give you more detailed information uh, at your next meeting. Um, noted the uh, addition of Angela Mills, who's, who's sticking with us. <laughs> <laughs> Whether she'll come in tomorrow or yeah. another question. <laughs> um, fast, perhaps. <laughs> uh, town Clerk Sandra Burgess, this is her last week, um, and is, is, we'll be missing her. Uh, Sue Adet, who is the Assistant Town Clerk, will be the Acting Town Clerk for the month of July. And then Margaret Nardowitz will be starting August 1st. We've also um, reached out to um, Sandra Burgess to help during the election process, which uh, Ms. Nardowitz has Nardowitz had requested. And also Ms. Puppel has um, agreed to, uh, or we've offered her the opportunity to help uh, with the transition uh, to Ms. Mills, but also to um, help with cleaning up the minutes that we have outstanding. Um, the uh, health insurance for the town employees and retirees is in the process of switching over. Um, people should have received their, their uh, insurance cards by now uh, or, in the, or tomorrow at the very latest. Um, this will um, become effective on July 1. So a lot of credit to the people who really managed through the process on the town and the school side for making that happen. It's really an, an important um, change over. And uh, we still, as you know, have the self-insurance program that we're still, anybody going to the doctor today or me um, because of my foot, um, uh, that will be under the old plan, but the new plan will be uh, kick in on July 1. Um, Want to note that the, there's an economic development forum, the third in the series on June 27th from three to five in this room. Um, the, uh, I'm not sure if members will mention these things, but if, I'll just mention, touch on them. The North Square dedication, the Valley Bike, you may want to talk about that. Um, uh, kickoff, two kickoffs, one in Northampton, one in Amherst. Um, and the other thing was that we had a meeting with the town of Hadley tonight immediately prior to this uh, meeting in the transition of their ambulance service to Action Ambulance. That is scheduled to go into effect on June 29th, which is Friday at 9 a.m., would give us a day in case anything goes wrong in terms of the switch over. The key thing is where are the calls being directed once they come into, um, into the Hadley um, dispatch center? Are they going to go to action or are they going to go to Amherst? Right now they, uh, they just push, if it's a medical call, they just push a button it automatically transfers the call, the call to our dispatch center um, on June 29th. Those will also begun, begin going to Hadley we, will, we have a mutual aid agreement we are working on with Hadley. Uh, we will continue to provide services through June 30th at midnight to them as, as needed uh, to help cushion that. They're very confident that they will make this happen on June 29th, which we're very pleased by, and we appreciate the cooperation and cooperation of our firefighters and dispatch um, center in, term, in helping to make this a, a changeover for the town of Hadley. So that's all I have to report today. Great. Thank you. So now um, we'll move to, to select board member reports. Does anyone have a member report? What about our uh, participating in, we participated in the town of Sunderland's, um, was it the 300, 300th anniversary celebration and uh, Mr. Slaughter and Mr. Steinbring and myself rode in the town's electric, all electric, vehicle, I think it says sustaining Amherst, and we actually got a lot of cheers and, and claps as we went by, and we had the town banner 
tied to the front of the car. Oh, I forgot the quarters I owe you. It only <laughs> flew up twice. <laughs> um, and I think that was a nice thing to do. And um, I don't really have any other member reports because my committee work has been pretty quiet the last couple of weeks. Mr. Steinberg, do you have? Um, I have no committee reports. So I'm going to keep it short. I think the, uh, the one thing that I will report on is that uh, the Mass School Building Authority was um, made a side visit to the Fort River School and um, two members of the school committee were present, superintendent, the, um, um, our buildings specialist, uh, Mr. McPherson was present and I was there representing select board since as you know we needed a select board representative and um, I thought it was a uh, really um, very um, thorough and productive conversation and uh, it was uh, pleased to see that um, after all that had happened that um, we put in a statement of interest and um, they didn't um, schedule initial visits um, with all communities that submitted a statement of interest, but they selected to come back to Amherst and to um, tour the Fort River School and to meet with all of us. And um, they, um, I think that we answered um, the questions that were posed to us and they allowed us to make a presentation of what the need is. Um, and. Uh, they are working on somewhat of a um, rolling basis where they're trying, they'll do assessments and uh, determinations of the amount of money that they have available and the size of the projects that they have seen in making a determination. So we could hear as early as December, but if we don't hear in December, it doesn't mean that we aren't in the next stage of this round. It's just that um, they are going to treat it on somewhat, um, somewhat of a rolling basis to, as they go through the process. Um, and uh, there were several events that um, I attended with various members of this board in the past few days, including the Habitat, um, uh, where, where our chair spoke, um, and uh, Ms. Brewer and I were at um, the meeting um, at the first congregational church um, where Congressman McGovern and many others spoke very eloquently about issues and among those um, was uh, Lucio Perez who spoke very eloquently about the current crisis um, in the immigration world and uh, so that's basically it. Ms. Brewer? Following up on that list, I was very sorry to miss the Habitat, uh, Hammers Community Land Trust, having been to the groundbreaking and then the dedication, so I appreciate all of those of you who could be there for 1073 to 1075 North Pleasant. Um, the, did they say that was the 40th and 41st unit? I believe that's correct, that's, yes. That's quite an impressive feat in Amherst. That's really amazing. Um, Thank you for mentioning the McGovern um, talk where lots of people talked about things they could do practically speaking and, and helping support in a variety of ways, both Lucio Perez directly and then also who to write to and who to put pressure on. Um, the Survival Center flipped their switch and our chair spoke at that as well. And flipping their switch had to do with their solar panel, so that was great. And we have a new chamber director starting on July 9th who is eager to meet with any of you individually to get your perspective on things. Happens to be a friend of mine named Claudia Pazmani who starts on July 9th. She's on vacation right now, so you don't have to email her right now. And then the Commonwealth Secretary, and um, this is where I'm going to have to start working with Ms. Mills as to what gets quoted in the minutes that Alyssa says. Um, <laughs> So Secretary Galvin came to town for what I would assume was his first visit ever to Western Massachusetts, and he talked about talking about write-ins at some point in the future to some group of people at some point. So it was not 
a workshop that some of us assumed it was going to be. It was an announcement about a workshop, but we made sure, thanks to helpful town staff, including Ms. Burgess and um, Ms. Sunred, to move the Amherst flag that we worked so hard on into the picture so it didn't just look like a beige hotel wall in Ohio that he was visiting <laughs> us in. Ohio. Not that there's anything wrong with a beige hotel room in Ohio, but <laughs> nonetheless, you know, it's like when you go to a conference, am I anywhere that I actually get to go outside at the conference? Yes, come to Amherst, at least be with the Amherst flag. We were hoping to have him on the steps, but apparently he wanted to be inside and he left us a, a poster about write-ins. But mainly he, there is going to be a regional town clerks meeting in July and he's going to make sure he or someone in his office is part of that to make it really clear how write-ins work. Because one of the weird things, for example, as was covered in the Gazette article, if you put a sticker on a space, well, first of all, don't put it under the wrong race. That would be a bad thing. But the other thing, because I won't count, but the other thing is if you put a sticker under somebody's name that's on the ballot and you don't mark the oval next to the sticker, Doesn't the count. intent, it does count. The intent is that you put the sticker on so you didn't have to mark the oval. However, if you put the sticker on, you are definitely not voting for the person on the ballot. So you really have to be careful. And so there's going to be a lot of hand counting done by staff because when it goes into the machine, it goes a different place if it's got a sticker on it. And uh, so that much more work for our election staff with a new, while returning, but still a new town clerk during a new town election on the day after Labor Day. So it is not going to be an easy challenge for staff. So I appreciate that he did come out and you know wants to get everybody on the same page as to how write-ins work in particular in this and another community that's having a lot of write-ins. Are you all set? Yeah. So I think since I have been at a variety of things with colleagues of mine on this, but not Mr. Wald. I've not been, I've not been anywhere <laughs> with Mr. Wald. <laughs> He's still in Prague. Um, so I've not been, uh, but I've been speaking at a lot of different things, have? trying to be very brief generally, so I will be brief this evening. But I will mention that Thursday, there are two different opportunities relative to the Valley Bike Share. So we've partnered with a number of communities here in Western Mass to, to cooperatively get together and buy um, uh, bicycles for use um, in a variety of communities. And so Northampton's having the f sort of full Everybody come from all the communities event at 11 p.m. at 11 p.m. <laughs> oh, yeah. 11 a.m. on Thursday morning at I believe it's Plasky Park. Mm -hmm. So right there in the middle of downtown Northampton, we are going to have our version of it, our local event at three o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Um, and so people can participate in either one of those and come see uh, the new bikes. Actually, here you'll actually get an opportunity. I think they're gonna have a few of the bikes out there. Electric assist, so you get a chance to ride your bike. If you do, I would recommend bringing a helmet. That's always a good thing to do when you're riding a bike, but we gift will. Certificates, gift certificates given out too. That's right, there, there will be some, some gift certificates given out to, uh, to get people uh, an opportunity to sort of try it out uh, without having to put out their own. Uh, but there are not an infinite amount of those, <laughs> there are a limited amount of those, but there are some gift certificates that are gonna be available uh, at that event as well. So we do wanna encourage people to come out and try out the new bikes, sort of hear about where they are and, and how the whole system works. Um, and I think that's all I have. PVTA meets on Wednesday this week. Go ahead. So I had two things. One, I want to ask you a question, but, and so I'll ask that. And then I was hoping that between the two of you, you would say something about the fact that, I know it was a whole week ago, but we had, North, we had the amazing North Square. Groundbreaking with Baker here, so maybe we can end on that, and I can ask my question in the meantime, which is we had had questions raised many times over the years about polling locations, but I know specifically ones come up associated with the primary for Crocker Farm, and so we will want to get back to people about the potential for having it at either Munson, which unfortunately isn't on the bus line, or potentially in one of the community rooms on East Hadley Road. Again, a thing with a whole changeover in staff, et cetera, but given the day after Labor Day being the first day of school for kindergartners, that ex that has been expressed to us, if we could follow up on that. And I just said, I'd mention it tonight, because I know you're already working on it with the town clerk. Right. But tell everybody about how awesome it was to have the governor visit us for the amazing north square groundbreak so the so the governor did come out um and and uh i was asked to speak i got to speak in a lot of things lately but i got to speak with that and at, at that event um 
you know, it was a lovely event in both the weather and it's always nice to have, you know, the folks from uh, Beacon as well as uh, the Jones family who's uh, the landowner and we got to speak and the governor spoke for, for a bit as well and he actually stuck around longer than I thought, just, to, you know, his schedule doesn't always afford that and so it was nice to have him uh, be there for a little bit of time and, and share some of his schedule with us and, and uh so it was a great opportunity for us to, to uh, as a community, to kind of come together and, and celebrate an event that, you know, does a lot of things for us as a community. It, it, you know, it creates more affordable housing. It creates housing in general, not just affordable, but affordable housing. It creates more commercial space for us in town. Uh, it it uh, redevelops an area of town that, that uh, uh, we're seeking to have that kind of redevelopment in, which is our, one of our village centers. And so it was really a nice opportunity and, and a lot of nice press for Amherst. Um, and it was nice to have the governor out, and uh, I think he also took the opportunity to swing by and see the chancellor at, at UMass a little bit. Um, but it was really a nice event and and uh, a beautiful day as well. But so we didn't get you know rain on or anything like that. But it was an, uh, a great opportunity for us to sort of showcase the fact that we are serious about and and uh, committed to affordable housing and 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 yet at the same time trying to do things like economic development and and those other components of, of making our community strong and, and reflective of our values. So it was nice. Um, is there anything else anyone wanted to mention? If not, I think we've completed our agenda for the evening, so I would take a motion. Move to adjourn. to adjourn. Thank you. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so we're adjourned at 1014 p.m. Thank you all, and thank you to Amherst Media, and congratulations on completing your first day. <laughs> and night. Please come back tomorrow.